This episode of the Tales of the Cock podcast is brought to you by the universe. We live in an abundant and fruitful universe. Enjoy it. My guest today is Dirty Ron Turner. I met Ron Turner one year ago when I visited 10th Planet Costa Mesa. I had just returned from Taiwan. I was very unsure about where I was going, what I wanted to live, but I knew I wanted to train and I knew 10th Planet from um, listening to so much uh, Joe Rogan Experience podcast. His best friend is Eddie Bravo. Eddie Bravo is the Grand Master of 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu. He's a third degree black belt, um, all around badass. And 10th Planet, it's one of the few gyms I know that's franchised out in such a way where there's 10 plant locations in most major cities now in America. Um, and so when I entered Costa Mesa, I was unsure about it, right? I, I had no idea what to expect. But when I got there, I took a nice class with Ron Turner. And I tried to explain to him, I was like, man, I'm in town for at least a week. I don't know where I'm going to live after that week. I'm going to you know, I'm gonna go down to San Diego. I might end up being there. I'm going to look for a job. I got no idea, man. I can't commit to anything. But here is some money. I don't know how much money I had, but maybe I had $20. And I was like, you know, I can give you this for the week. Is that okay? And he's like, dude, don't pay me at all. That's not really how he talks, but those were his words. That was his sentiment. And it was just amazing. I was blown away by it. Um, but this is a thing I've seen in a couple of different jiu-jitsu gyms. Uh, Rodrigo Medeiros uh, had the same mentality when I eventually one week after that, did move down to San Diego. He did the same thing. And it's just such like a refreshing mentality in this day and age where, you know, everything is uh, enter your credit card before approval, um, pay first, pay up front, which makes sense in the short term, but in the long term, I've given 10th Planet much more of my money than <laughs> that $20 or whatever I would have given if, you know, if they'd just been rude, if they just taken my money. Or, um, you know, the... the other example of Costa Mesa is the Art of Jiu-Jitsu. It's a very famous Jiu-Jitsu academy, much more famous than 10th Planet um, locally, just because the the head guy there, Hoffa Mendez, he's the current world champion. He's been world champion six six times. And so the gym is much more crowded. And so to enter the gym is $60. So I only entered that gym once. And my point is that Ron Turner is just a great dude. Uh, he He's the one of the main reasons I joined 10 Plant Jiu-Jitsu, where I've been training for the past six months and plan to continue to do so. And I just really appreciate him coming on the podcast. Um, the, this is much more of a dark interview than I expected because uh, the, the the timing of it was kind of surprising me. I thought I'd have more time to prepare. So I did have questions written out, but I had written them out like a week or two in advance. They weren't really fresh in my mind. I didn't feel very connected to them. So um, I apologize if the interview was a little sloppy, but I think it came out well. You know, Ron, he's a very open guy. He came out about you know, the death of his parents, which I didn't know. And he talks about his OCD issues, which I asked him after the interview, like, do, do your students know that you struggled with OCD severely? He goes into the details. And he's like, no, man, I don't think anybody knew. And so I just really appreciate his openness and candor. I think um, anyone listening who knows Ron will learn a lot about him from this interview. Um, but we did have some sound issues, which I do apologize for. My neighbors are getting uh, some construction done. So in addition to the normal um, airplanes that fly over my backyard and uh, the sound of lighters as we're smoking, <laughs> we do have some construction. I, I did consider moving inside to avoid the construction noise, but I also wanted to give Ron the opportunity to continue smoking um, you know, to his comfort level. And uh, inside, we won't have been able to do that. So I think I made a good choice in staying outside, but... It is annoying, I'm sure, so I apologize, but in the future we'll work on that. And so after this interview, I also did a, about a 30-minute thing with uh, my roommate and good friend Rex Nelson, uh, commemorating my one year back in America. I decided to talk about my trips into Asia, um, in particular living in Taiwan. It's, it's something I was thinking I should go do again. It's something I think about all the time, but I haven't really talked about on the podcast. So after the interview with Ron, the interview goes about an hour. There is uh, 30 minutes or so of me talking to Rex about Asia. So feel free to listen to that if you're into it. Um, But in the meantime, enjoy this conversation with Ron Turner. Hoping to look to do it again sometime. All right, man. Let's get started. Ron Turner, my friend. How's it going? Dude, so terrible, man. Woke up today, went to your class, got destroyed by these savages. You taught me a cool move. I tried it. You know, I tried it. It, uh... Didn't work out for me. I for myself. A for effort. <laughs> Thanks, man. We'll let you know a secret. A lot of the moves I try don't work out for me either. <laughs> Usually like the third or fourth one down the list that works. It's cool. We'll cut out that part. We don't need to talk totally, about it. Totally, totally. <laughs> don't talk about my failures and my 
shortcomings. <laughs> Actually, that's um, only what I want to talk to you about. Okay. So what's your biggest failure, Ron? Uh, <laughs> honestly? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd say <laughs> my biggest failure, <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I made some bad decisions in life when it's come to uh, women. Ah, yeah. So Classic. I would say that is my biggest failure, but I don't believe that, like, it's a failure. It's more a learning process, you know? It's a good way to put it. Ron. But yeah, I think that's my big. For myself, if I was going to look back on disappointments, I should have listened a little more instead of acted. You know, I thought I thought I knew better. <laughs> but little did I know. And that how we all feel, though. Yeah. So I got some special tea for you today, Ron. You're okay. some tea like this. I've never seen anything like that. It's <laughs> like it's compressed. It looks like it used to be part of like a bigger cake of some sort. You know, like you've seen like yeah. when, like people smuggle in heroin. Yeah. It's like a brick. Um, I don't really know what this is. This is a sample. I don't really know what It looks this like is. the weed we used to get back in the 90s. <laughs> Brown? Dude, literally, yeah, compressed. Like, I broke some up one time. You used to have to separate the stems and the seeds, uh-huh. and there's a fucking scorpion in there. <laughs> like, it had been compressed in there, and I'm sure I smoked part of it before I figured out there was a scorpion in there, you know? <laughs> so how do you rationalize that? Like, there, there's a scorpion at the weed factory? I guess, <laughs> man. Coming out of Mexico, wherever it was coming from, you know, it got compressed up in the, the stuff. That's crazy, man. I never experienced that. Uh, I always think, like, the, the thing that I'll be able to tell my grandkids will blow their mind is that I used to buy weed from a Mexican in Santa Ana. They're like, what? You wouldn't just go to the store? Yeah. It was like, that became popular. <coughs> I remember, like, in high school, like, I started hearing about medicinal marijuana, and you could, like, go to a place with a door and security. <laughs> well, and It was mind-blowing. When I uh, first started fighting... Um, I, when I when I was like trying to be serious about my training, you might say. When I, was this? Um, well, I started in '94, and then I I decided to clean my act up as far as like uh, partying and that kind of stuff, and and you know. Were you drinking a lot of the time? Uh, I've never been a huge drinker, but I was drinking. You know, I'd go out with my friends and party. I mean, you know, I was 21, 22, 23, 19, whatever. Yeah. And uh, I didn't really run around with the cleanest group of people. You know, we we all did our things, and. Uh, I think I I found that, yeah, maybe jiu-jitsu was something I was talented at and fighting, I wanted to give it a shot. So I decided to clean everything up because in my mind, you know, weed had been demonized, mm. you know, all this stuff. And I was like, well, I can't do it at all. So I didn't do it for 12 years. I was completely sober, Whoa. nothing. I mean, I would drink maybe once or twice a year, maybe a little bit more here and there depending on the celebration. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, definitely no weed. So I went from buying it illegally, you know, or buying it from, the neighborhood guys or whoever my friends whoever yeah. had it the dark to, ages yeah i went into a place i got my prescription and uh i walked into a dispensary and it was like going to a pharmacy or like a, uh-huh. a showroom and i was like wow this is amazing like they had everything all lined up and it's pretty and packaged and it was just amazing to see like this is what it should be mm-hmm. you know it should be that prices way. Prices, every you're not getting like you're not Scales. getting finagled or scammed you know mm-hmm. you know what it is and they're weighing it in front of you and it just made it a lot better because honestly, they say that weed is a gateway drug. I don't believe that. I believe where you're buying it is the gateway to other drugs. Because <laughs> the only reason I tried other it. things is because the guy had it. He it's was a like, package deal. "Hey, look, I got weed, but I also got these mushrooms, yeah, and I also yeah. got this stuff." You know what I mean? And a little, little by little, you you start playing around, and next thing you know, you know, weed isn't the thing you're messing with anymore. It's true. Luckily for me, I had a good kind of scope on addiction and that kind of thing and uh i knew where i should and shouldn't play you know what i mean you had friends who struggled with addiction Is that how you yeah, yeah yeah uh, my family my mom and dad were both uh my dad was sober for about 20 years my mom about the same and my dad relapsed when he died he would relapse and went down the sh- 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 sh. that causes death yeah yeah he got into pills and pain pills and that was one of my decisions and uh Deciding to use medicinal marijuana again was because I've got back, neck, multiple injuries just over years of training. Of course. And arthritis. And, you know, everything that comes with long-term uh, sports, you know, like you're, mm-hmm. you're in it for a lifetime, you're going to have something. And they kept giving me muscle relaxers and pain pills, and it really wouldn't cure the problem. It would just lay me up. I'd be in bed like a zombie, laying there drooling or sleeping all the time, and I wasn't functional. Um, and I told myself I'm not going to do that because I could see myself going down that hill. You know, right. like it was real easy to, to keep doing this. It's a slippery slope. It is. Sure. Yeah. And I I told myself if it happens one more time, if my back locks up, I have these muscle spasms, I'm going to give it a try. Because I'd heard so much good, uh, you know, good stuff about marijuana helping you, muscle relief, that kind of stuff, eating it. Um, 
So it happened one more time. I gave it a shot. For the first time in years, I slept all the way through the night. Mm. I slept like nine, ten hours, deep sleep. I woke up the next day, and the muscle spasms that would be with me for weeks were gone. Wow. It just took that one time for me to relent and let my body relax. And I was sold after that. I went and, you know, I haven't touched an aspirin in years. You know? Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't mess with too much um, of that stuff. That's crazy because you're an active guy, man. You're teaching classes. Like, how many classes do you teach a day? Usually, like About three. Two, two, two or three, or three yeah, at least. And no days off. That's pretty much every day. Yeah, that's crazy, man. So even if you're not rolling, like, you're doing something. You know, you're out. You're yeah. showing moves. Yeah. And that, you know, it, it didn't hit me till this year that even just showing moves over and over and over again for three classes... I could do a move 300 times. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Imagine doing 300 push-ups. Like, that's, that's, you'd be sore at the end of the day. Of course. And I, don't, I didn't realize it, you know? If I show a triangle choke to an arm lock for the class, then I have to show it 20 more times because there's going to be questions asked. As mm-hmm. I walk around, I'll show it again. I'll, hey, guys, look at this, or I'll show a little nuance, and yet I'm going through the same motion. So that repetitive use, repetitive motion, I mean, shit, people get carpal tunnel from typing. Yeah. yeah I have a 200-pound guy in my leg stacking on me, and, yeah. you know. I remember that. I, I worked in an office for two months. I had an accounting job. And just in that little time, I felt like my posture was getting terrible. And I was like, how the fuck do people do this for, like, 20 years? But I'm sure as people show up to jiu-jitsu and they think the same thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're what, sweating. and doing this? <clears throat> the biggest thing people need to get over, though, is, like, the... I think the breathing part at first. A lot of guys hold their breath, but they're like, they're grunting and they're 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 hyperventilating, and it's because of nerves and because they're unsure where they're at. You know, mm-hmm. I think once you learn to relax with that, the the training becomes a little easier. You learn how to breathe. Yeah, and that's something I've just been going over with myself with uh, yoga. You know, we just started a good yoga program at Costa mm-hmm. Mesa. It expanded to three days. I've been going up to Whittier and studying yoga with um, uh, what's Anthony. That? Anthony Yoga yeah. Lockdown. Yoga yeah. Lockdown, which I love. It's great stuff. And it's really helping, man. Like he's awesome. He has like a mobile mobile yoga facility. Uh huh. Yeah, that, he lives yeah. in a van. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> you know, that's I was online the other day. I didn't mean to cut you off, but oh, I saw fun. van something dot com, and it's about like the the millennials and stuff like that. These people that are, are basically doing what a lot of our students are doing, and they're cutting ties with the electric bills and having rent, and mm-hmm. they're living in vans. Yeah. You know, and you think, oh, it's a, you're a bum, but I don't I don't think that at all. You know, I think it's a it's kind of unique and it's interesting because that money, when you're young, you should be doing things like traveling and and uh, taking risks and enjoying life because later on when you have kids and all this other stuff, your life is no longer yours. It belongs to them too. Right. And uh, you kind of have to sacrifice a lot of that stuff. So when you're young, you're stuck in an apartment, especially in Orange County. You're paying mm-hmm. 1300 bucks a month, 1500 bucks a month. Or you're splitting at 800, and you got your bills. You got some car you bought that well, you thought was cool. Student loans. Student nowadays. loans. Yeah, you know, credit yeah. cards. And next thing you know, you're a cog in the wheel, that big machine, man. You're just trugging along, trying mm-hmm. to make things happen. You don't get to travel. You don't get to do anything. You get to work all day in some workplace. Come home for maybe two hours that you get to see your house, and you sleep in it, and get up, and leave that place. Yet you're paying all your money into it. You know, yeah, this is the exact conversation I had with Matt Salinas when he was on the podcast. He's a he's perfect example, cars. dude. Where is he right now? He's in like Oregon somewhere, sleeping by a river. I just saw him jump off like a hundred foot cliff into the <laughs> bright blue water, and I'm like, dude, how good is this guy having it right now? Like, yeah, he's sleeping in in, in a car, but so mm-hmm. what? He's in the redwoods. He's he's jumping off cliffs into the the ocean. You know, like, the, the stuff he's getting to experience and see are the memories are going to stay with him. You're not going to remember your apartment you had for two years in, you know, Irvine. You're going right. to remember the moment with your best friend camping out in the wilderness for a month when you took a risk and put it all in and said, I'm going to spend all my money right now. I'm going to drive all the way up to Canada with my dog <laughs> and my best friend and see what happens. You know, that's, that's pretty cool. And the irony is that that's way cheaper. Like, yeah. this trip he's on is, like, I'm sure it's cheaper than, like, a month of rent. Maybe two months. I don't know. But, like, th- no one told me that growing up. Like, you could yeah. save money by doing doper stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I'll be honest with you. If, if I was not a parent and I was single right now, I would be in Thailand probably living. You know, use the money yeah. I have as income and uh, live like a king over there for a little while. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a few friends that did it. and uh, I spent I, three months in Thailand out of college. Yeah, you've done it. you gotta you got to see the world. You have to get out and... You know, a lot of people haven't even seen the United States. Yeah. They haven't seen California. They, they've maybe gone within their little area or they travel by airplane somewhere mm-hmm. and then go to, like, you know, the fucking 
Pizza Hut or whatever. The, <laughs> you know what I mean? Some cookie cutter, cookie cutter restaurant or something. Yeah, you, you don't get the local flair. No, and yeah. I mean you're missing out a lot. You know, uh, that was one thing with fighting or with jujitsu and martial arts. I really wanted to do is travel. You know, I got to go to Canada. Um, I've been all over the United States pretty much, back and forth. Um, but now I want to go somewhere. I want to go to Japan. That's my next stop. Cool. That's my bucket list. That's number cool. one is Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Ten plan Tokyo. Whatever, man. <laughs> Doesn't matter where it is. I like. I would like to go train with Sakuraba and Ooh. go there. Okay. You know, there's a bit, huge language barrier and stuff, but he uh, opened my eyes to jujitsu could be crazy and playful, and fighting doesn't have to be this cookie cutter thing because he would do like karate chops and axe <laughs> kicks and flip over the guard and uh-huh. really crazy stuff Successfully back then. Successfully too. Yeah. Yeah. And people don't know what we're talking about, man. Sakuraba, he was like a, a legend in Japan. He was like a super professional wrestler before that. He fought in a mask, like yeah. professional wrestler. Yeah, he did pro wrestling. Brought over so. to Pride. And like against all odds, he started just destroying guys. Like he beat how many Gracies? Four? Yeah. Beat four Gracies. Yeah. Like the only man to ever do that. Yeah. And he's silly. Quite he's a like few the of them with Kimuras, guy. too, which is funny because uh-huh. that's. Uh, he snapped their arms. Yeah. That was the move that beat Elio. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool, man. Hey, uh, what's in this tea? I got kind of like a, a good erection right now. Is it good from the tea? <laughs> uh, are you drugging me? <laughs> it's all things combined, man. It's okay, good tea. Cool. I have yeah. these nice shorts on. I actually on feel like the shirt. scene from Karate Kid 2. <laughs> you know, Karate Kid 2 where the girl and him, they had the tea ceremony, then the tornado happens. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, it's very similar. Hey, I orchestrated that. It's, awesome, uh, man. Tornado's coming soon. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was a huge Karate Kid fan. That's why you did it. Tornado's coming. We'll have to go lift the log off of Sato. <laughs> I'm down, dude. Right. I haven't seen the Karate Kid 2 in about 38 years, but I remember it too well. <laughs> I actually have the box set. I have every Karate Kid movie, and when I would drive my daughter to school, we'd watch them. And when I'd pick her up, because I had a DVD player that would play while you drove, you know? <laughs> and, it was uh, dangerous of all things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right on the dash. So we, we'd sit in traffic and you'd just Karate Kid it up, you know? That's sick. Yeah. That's what got me into all this, Karate Kid 1. Yeah? I, yeah, I saw that, and that was it. went and... Beg my parents for karate lessons at <laughs> six years old. <laughs> yeah. and that was it. I was doing my katas. How much did you do karate for? <clears throat> Shit, probably six years, maybe a little longer. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, got dis- disillusioned. Really? Yeah. How so? Or why? Uh, I'd gotten in a fight, and uh, the kid headlocked me, threw me on the ground. And beat the shit out of me. <laughs> I got my karate stance. I waited for his punch to come. Yet he threw a big looping punch and it cracked me. I did my my up block, you know. Uh, and uh, I see. <laughs> you blocked for a very specific punch. Yeah, so and he threw something different. One, yeah. And then uh, at that very young age, I realized that uh, if you're on the ground, there is no karate. Yeah. I was getting wrestled. Um, did you ask your coach about it? No, I was very embarrassed. Okay. You know, I was already like a, a small kid. Had a, I had some self-esteem issues growing up. You know what I mean? So that was bad enough. <laughs> Are you gonna walk oh, hey. delivery? <laughs> nice. In a blender. Well, why not? I will take a piece. What's up, Andrew? Hey. How are you? <laughs> First time ever we had a watermelon delivery. <laughs> All right. Well. Well, that's not annoying. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can hear that, that's the African mocking finch. (laughs) Uh, They are notoriously known for interrupting podcasts and tea ceremonies. Um, But they lead to better pools. They do. The neighbors are going to get a better pool now. They're digging a pool. (laughs) Yeah, let's see. If that continues, maybe we'll have to move inside. I don't know how this is coming out. You actually sound like the Predator is watching us. <laughs> We're going to get shot by the Predator now. Which I'm down for, man. I wrote that in my notes, like, if the Predator comes, take the shot. It'll be epic. We'll have Andrew upload the podcast. It'll get yeah. out there. We'll be shot. But that's fine. I'm down. I'm down. Let me check the sound. All right. Let's dive into some questions, man. Let's I wrote up some really big questions for you. Uh, first and foremost, most important, are you aware of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Yes, I am. Okay. Tell me everything you know. Um, he was a Jew. True. And the Jews killed him. <laughs> True. One of their own. And, uh, yeah. Cool. I believe in a higher power, if that's what you're asking. That's a good answer. Yeah. 
I, I was really just kind of segue into um, this joke I know, but <laughs> 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 I just read this really uh, funny book about Jesus. It's a fictional story about the. I'm years. a Jew, by the way, so don't pardon me if I came up with <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there. It was a bit anti Semitic. <laughs> I started thinking about what I said. I'm like, you know, they didn't know I was Jewish. That sounds kind of anti Semitic, yes, but. Uh, uh, so anyway, this is this, this book. It's the years like thirteen to thirty, which is not are not covered in the Bible. No. It's just it is just not mentioned. And so in the book, he travels east. He goes to Afghanistan to meet the wise men. He goes to China to be the next one. And in China, they're teaching kung fu, and law kung fu is these weapons <coughs> that to defend the temples. But he doesn't want to spill blood because he's Jesus. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. Yeah. So they teach him how to fight without weapons and how to use his opponent's energy against him. And since he's Jewish, they call it judo. Oh, I like that. <laughs> That's one of the funniest parts of the book. Yeah, judo. Yeah. And since or they're in China, they make him, they make him uh, Chinese food for his birthday. And the narrator's like, I hear this tradition continues. That's so hilarious. Jews eating Chinese food. Chinese for, food on Christmas. Yeah. The only thing that's open. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. All right. So it's higher power you believe in, Ron. Tell yeah. me its name. Uh, it, it has all names. Okay. <clears throat> I, I don't believe that anyone is right. I believe that uh, there's universal energy that's in all of us. We're all built to the same thing, to the tiniest form, you know, the tiniest piece. And uh, if you were to go tell a Native American about Jesus and show him Jesus, I don't think that would transfer over well. So I or believe it would become Mormonism. Yeah, isn't that what Mormon- <laughs> pretty much? Yes, isn't that what Mormonism is? <laughs> yes, Jesus Christ crossed the. I ocean. don't believe that. <laughs> there, no motherfucker found a bunch of plates and this, that, and the other thing. That I don't believe too much in that. Um, but I don't know. I, I believe that maybe uh, the higher power shows himself to you or herself to you or itself to you, and the best way that you could absorb it or or handle it, maybe you know, okay. or maybe not at all. Okay. This sounds very close to Taoism. Yeah. Are you familiar with Taoism? Yeah. I, uh, one thing on my mom, she had a heart attack in the hospital after surgery, and she didn't know she had it, right? Mm. And she told me the angels came for her the night before, and they're trying okay. to get her to go, and she said she wasn't ready. And I was like, I straight up told her, my mom, you're fucking on morphine. <laughs> 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 you're high as fuck. <laughs> Anyways, they sent her home the next day, right? <laughs> they pulled the chest tubes out, sent her home, and when she laid down for the first time, she passed away. And, oh. uh, she had had a heart attack that night in a hospital that no one had seen it when you know what i mean mm-hmm. and uh when she laid down that's why she had a heart attack because her blood overwhelmed her heart that wasn't working at 100 percent. so that night the angels did come for her you okay. know what i mean she came ready yeah that's why the angels tattooed on me it's for my mom pretty much oh i see on your on yeah your mom there. taking my dad to heaven okay. but uh yeah so it, it made me start believing in that kind of stuff you know or i already did believe but start thinking about it a little bit more you know and how old were you at the time i was 19 Oh, she wow. died, yeah. Oh, that's young. Yeah, and then wow. dad at 21. Oh, wow, that's really young. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, very different lives, you and I. You just met yeah. my dad, he's 60. Yeah. I'm 25. <laughs> but, you know, I think about it, and I wouldn't be the man I am today if they were still here. Oh, absolutely. Not to say anything bad about my parents. Mm-hmm. They were great people, had a great upbringing. Um I just think that it made me have to be stronger. It made me have to be a man at mm-hmm. a younger age and stand up and to start doing things because I did leave my life a little bit differently before all that happened, you know. Oh, for sure. And I've had that thought about, like, um, I've been living here with my parents for the past six months. Mm-hmm. I had moved out for seven years. And so I proved, like, I can live on my own. I lived in yeah. Taiwan for, like, a year and a half and, like, did things on my own. But I'm back here, and it's very easy. You know, Mom does shopping. She likes doing it. You know, there's just a lot of things going on yeah. that make me really soft. And so I had the thought many times, like, this would be a lot. It'd be to my advantage for them to kick me out. But with the way things are now, I'm not just going to leave. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it is kind of interesting in that way when sometimes, like, this isn't something I have too much experience with. I don't know anyone who's died. I've, I've, I have three living grandparents, and the one that died I wasn't that close to. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I've been very fortunate <coughs> in that way. But <clears throat> there are times in life when you get forced into something. Like, I kept thinking, like, in Taiwan, it would have been great if I got, um, what's even the word, being kicked out of a country, deported. <laughs> <laughs> I kept thinking that, like, because it was always an option. Like, uh, the job I had was teaching kindergarten, which is an illegal activity in Taiwan. You're not supposed to teach someone under the age of six. Oh. I don't know why. And then the other illegal thing I was doing was stand-up comedy, which, like, because, like, it's not taxable or something, like, s- some sort of tax reason. 
you're not allowed to just go up and do open mic stand-up comedy. So I was facing deportation every time I did it, and I was kind of waiting for it. In the same way, I'm kind of waiting for my parents to kick me out. Like, yeah. <coughs> it, would be, it would be cool. It would be the next chapter of the adventure. But it's hard to make that step without that, you know. Yeah, we get comfortable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you were just to go, I'm out of here today. I have nowhere to go. I'm going to do it. That's so hard. <laughs> yeah, you're like, that's like telling yourself, you know what, for the next two days, I'm not going to eat food. Yeah. It fucking sucks, you know. It, yeah. It's something that's hard to do, but... Maybe that fasting would be healthy for you. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll have a better bowel movement the next time you... I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, every yeah. gift has its price. Every price has its gift. Yeah. Very true. Let's see. I, I, I plan on not smoking on this podcast, and then you peer yeah, pressure me. You know how you do. You, you, I you do, peer yeah. pressure me. Flogged. So how long did you do MMA for? You, you uh, on and off, my, my Hoyer. This had a handful of fights. I, did, I lost more than I won. Okay. It was... Uh, I fought more for the experience, right? Like, I'm doing all this training, and then it, it's like jerking off and not coming after a while, <laughs> you know? Like, okay. you, you have to... I needed somewhere where I could maybe test it or, or get it out of me. I felt like I had fight in me, and I would take a fight and do it. Okay. And uh, more for the martial arts side of things in me. Not to be the best in the world, the world champion. I fought on the same card as Tony Ferguson, mm. and uh, <clears throat> I look at him and I look at me and our mindset... And uh, just our physical abilities naturally are too fucking so different. We're in the same weight class. And I'm pretty real with myself. Like, what, why would I try to do that when I know that that's the best in the world? You know what I mean? And I'm definitely not that. So I'm just kind of real with myself. And I would fight here and there. Okay. Compete when I wanted. You know what I mean? You're doing jiu-jitsu along the way? Like jiu-jitsu the whole time. I was more, yeah, on and off. Back in the early days, there weren't as many as there are now. Right. You know, now uh, it's ridiculous, man. They're every weekend. It's every single weekend. And were they always, like, this expensive? Like, tournaments are yeah. expensive. Yeah, man. and you would get one match. There weren't a lot of the round-robin tournaments. Uh, Chris Brennan would do a round-robin tournament, and uh, you would get multiple matches. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. So I remember the, really looking forward to when the guys were able to do those, and, and uh, you get more matches out of it. Because, you know, John Jock did tournaments back in the day. Uh, I mean, there, you know, there was Grappler's Quest. But then again, if you didn't win... You were done. Yeah. And you had to wait months for another tournament. It wasn't like now, you know? Interesting. Matt, you had a good idea that you, you presented to me a couple months ago. I haven't heard anything about it since. Um, about having, like, Friday night uh, I- informal tournaments of some yeah. sort. Like, gym versus gym. Well, I have a lot it of ideas. Really now, me making these ideas come to fruition, it's another story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why I have <laughs> oh, business partners. Some <laughs> <laughs> my Our teammates and business partners that are here with us, they are, um, they are more able to uh, handle the business side of things. Ron, this is Get Andrew, by the way. We met before. How are you doing? Hey, really? Hey. You met Andrew. Good, good. <laughs> we're at the, talking at the tournament. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. So fair enough, fair enough. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, you know. But uh, where were we at? Uh, Friday night tournament. Oh, yeah, Friday night. I want so what I was thinking, selfishly. yeah, it, uh, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I played baseball, mm-hmm. the baseball league. Every, every weekend, you had a, a game you would play. Right. You'd practice during the week. So what I was thinking was, why not have a, the local gyms all in the area all be in a league? And each gym on Friday night has, say, four weight classes, five weight classes. And you have your team who are, wrestle off for the best, best guy during the week. So say Wednesday night, okay, for this Friday, we're going to wrestle off for this weight class. You guys, whoever wins, wins. You get to compete on the weekend. Or you just get your best guys. However the gym wants to do it. So Friday night comes, I bring my five guys and you have your five guys. We'll host it at whatever gym, your gym, my gym, and we see who wins. You what know? do you think of this, Ron? So we do it normal style, one on one, obviously, and yes. at the end, five on five. That'd be interesting. Sounds like we're in Russia, though. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen a lot of those videos. Yeah. They're like, we're gonna take like a multi-level <laughs> course with round objects, sharp objects, and you guys are gonna fight on it. Dude, that's the craziest thing I've seen. I've seen those videos. Yeah. They're running up slides. It's like a jungle gym, but padded. Well, you know, life means less in other countries. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> so for them, like, oh, he might get hurt? Oh, no, who cares? He might get hurt. He's yeah, alive. fucking dump him off that thing. He's in a triangle choke. Yeah. Drop three stories. <laughs> yeah, exactly. On his head. I was like, dude, no fucking way could you pay me to do that. There's no way. No way. Well, I'd fall one half level and hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's madness, man. Have you seen them? They do... Um, MMA in full armor. Yeah. 
Dude, it's it's crazy. Judo tossing a knight. That's why we're having such a hard time getting this stuff on the up and up everywhere. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> yeah. That's holding us back. The Russians are holding us back. <laughs> I'm just clearly kidding. <laughs> Don't come after me. <laughs> no, the real problem is that they're white as well. That's, That's true. That's really like That's true. Just makes it look real that. redneck. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to jump my truck over a creek over there. You ready? <laughs> um, but back to what I was saying. Yeah, so, and you would basically have, uh, so if it's, you know, you do a points thing, you know, how, whoever, however got the most submissions. They win. It's sub only, right? And then the next week, you go against another school. And you have, you know, like like Major League Baseball, any other team sport, you go up the ladder, and whoever at the end of the season has the most wins wins a trophy. Mm. They would be the reigning champions. So the next year or next season, you would go and try to defeat the reigning champions. Okay. And uh, kind of do it like that. Make an actual big trophy or some kind of plaque to hang in their gym, something cool. And uh, maybe bring the community together because I know that a lot of us cross-train or are able to now. But I believe there's still some, some standoffishness oh, with some sure. other schools and that kind of thing. For sure. When in reality, we are all doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. I may bend my leg a little different and put my foot here. I may believe that I want to grab onto flesh rather than a lapel. Maybe I do both. You know what I mean? It's like, but people put up these walls, these fences. I go, oh, fuck those guys. I can't train with them. In reality, we're all grappling. It's all the same shit. There's some guys at some other gym at a Gracie school right now, and they're chopping the shit together, joking, making, oh, yeah. you know, fucking around. Go, you see that move on YouTube? Did you see so and so doing the same thing we do at every other school? But yeah. we can't be friends with those guys, you know. Yeah, and you know, ironically, man, like <coughs> it's a big thing um, in no gi is like, oh, those gi guys hate us. But I've noticed that more and more of that mentality at Tenth Planet than any other gym. That what? Um, that like uh, us versus them dichotomy. This like. Because I've trained in gi schools all over, uh-huh. and like I, I, I've been a fan of Tenth Planet like long before I trained here, and we brought it up, and like you know I tried rubber guard three years ago when I had no business doing it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like yeah, I don't yeah. know anything else either. <laughs> and then, um, and so all these things are like, oh yeah, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. But then you come, I came to Tenth Planet, and it's like talking about the gi is like sacrilege. You know, it's like yeah, much yeah. more extreme in that way. Um, ironically, I would have thought it would have been different. You know what I mean? Like. A ten planet preaches this open mindedness and yeah, then yeah. you bring up the gi and it's like, Oh fuck them. What? Who? What? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean I know a lot of us cross train. Mm-hmm. Um but I think from years of people just the fuckery at tournaments and just the the shit talking online. I mean if you go online, there's a few of you that are listening to this right now that are my friends on Facebook, <laughs> uh, Mark Parrish, that like to talk <laughs> shit on Tenth Planet. You come train Tenth Planet with us all the time. Um <laughs> And I know you do it just to get a rise because you're a troll. Okay, um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of trolls, <laughs> all trolls of out there. But you know what I mean? Like, trolling. like all this shit we got to put up with and just deal with and the endless arguments. I really don't get in them. I just watch them, mm-hmm. you know, and sit on the sidelines. But I think some people are probably just fed up with it, you know? Yeah. Because before Eddie uh, went with Hoyler the second time, it was real bad. Yeah, that makes sense. You know? Yeah. Before his, uh, I just thought, like, that, math, uh, that match, like, proves 10 Proved Eddie Bravo's yeah. system. Like, it does work against the greatest. Yeah. Like, you can't say anything bad about Hoyler, but people will try. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> here's the thing: it's there's other instructors too that are revolutionary. Mm-hmm. They get the same backlash. Oh, it doesn't work, my friend. You of know, course, yeah. Elio did that back in the day. That twister. You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Elio's twisting people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he probably has. Yeah. Honestly, I, every move has been done a million times over, probably. The human body is a human body, and it's been meant to its extremes, I'm sure. Especially when warfare was a little more hand-to-hand back in the day, you know? Yeah. You wish you were alive back then, Ron? Fuck no. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have to saw your leg off. What? <laughs> saw my leg off? Do you have antibiotics? No, what the fuck? <laughs> or, like, today in the gym, the guy got a weird, like, uh, his nose is bleeding a yeah. lot. Like what was it? Like the the, the part the, down here, the middle know septum. I don't know, like, septum? like the skin between the nostrils. The septum kind of cut. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't deep enough for a stitch though. It would just be a butterfly. I mean, it looked bad, but it wasn't bad. It just bled a lot at first. But my point is, you guys had like boxes of like Anti- things to like, yeah. so you don't have to chop off his head. Back <laughs> in the day, they'd be like, "Oh, you're screwed. That little cut, you're dead. Done. Some rat's gonna lick on it and gnaw it off in the middle of the night. You're done." Yeah, Matt Burn. It's a wrap, dude. It's yep. a wrap. <laughs> yep, you're done. <laughs> All right. So gratitude's a good thing to express. We're lucky to be alive. Thank yes, you, Ron. Thank, thank you. you for thank that. you for this year and time. <laughs> How old are you now, Ron? Uh, I'll be 41 in a month. Yeah? How old do you feel? I'm Peter Pan. Yeah? 
yeah, I mean, yeah, I hurt and I ache, but I don't think I look my age. I don't think I act my age. <laughs> I still ride a skateboard. I, st- <laughs> I still joke around with the best of them. <coughs> Always wearing hats. Yeah. So it I, seems like a young guy thing. I work out every day. Um, I believe being young is a state of mind. I never wanted to try to be that old guy that, fucking, you got your IRA. You know, like, I just, that's not me. I grew up in Southern California playing heavy metal music and <laughs> skateboarding and just, you know, uh, and I, I get to wrestle with you guys every day. I mean, my job, literally, I get to dress up in spandex like a superhero. Mm-hmm. I play fight all day long and get to hang out and do fart jokes with my friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? I am a, a, I am a kid at heart, and I will stay that way. I surround myself matrix. with, yeah, with young people. And 41 just happened. Mm. I look at it like this. My parents were both dead by this age, pretty much. My dad a few years from now. My mom didn't live past this age. Oh, wow. So for me... I look at them and have what they were at this point in life, and I'm just trying to live life and be happy and enjoy things and, you know, be me. Fuck, I get to do jiu-jitsu every day. How, <laughs> it's awesome, you know? I'm very grateful. I don't make the most amount of money in the world, but I make enough money to be comfortable, and uh, I get to do what I love. And for this, in this time, in this moment right now, that's fucking amazing and things are awesome. Now it could go drastically wrong and everything else, but I, I will say for one point in my life I did what my dream was you know I made a living at it and uh, I am enjoying it how long have you been able to do this like full time jiu jitsu I've always done it full time but you mean without another job yeah yeah uh, about like uh, other about nine months oh wow it's new yeah I was always well, lucky in... for me man I came in at the right time well you I had the same schedule yeah I would just be working at night until five in the morning Ooh. yeah how was that it was hard. <laughs> uh, got a good caffeine addiction off of it. I was okay. drinking rock stars and Red Bulls like it was. Uh, there was no end, but it <clears throat> it was it. I was able to pay my bills, and uh, we were able to keep the money in the school. And then once everything was ready to go, we were all able to kind of like take a step back, and uh, I was able to quit the job and just do this, you know. That's cool, man. You yeah. notice your teaching style changed at all? Yeah, I can be a little more enthusiastic. I'm rested. Uh, I can approach each day with just that on my mind as opposed to, shit, I'm going to have to work all night tonight. I'm exhausted. Um, you have all these things that draw you away from the moment, you know? Mm-hmm. And when you're teaching, there's 20, 30 people in the room that need my utmost attention, and I need to be paying attention so that I see what they're doing, doing it right, doing it wrong. Um, and I think with work, I'd be there like, fuck, my back hurts. I have to stand all night. I'd be pouring drinks. I hope that douchebag isn't in there tonight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all a these million things. Million things yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. all of a sudden, you're no longer in the room with the students. You're in your head at work when you're not even there, you know? And at the end of the night, you're hurting so bad. And you get in at work. While I'm working, I'm thinking, fuck, I got to get up in the morning and teach. I'm fucking exhausted right now. How am I going to sleep? Am I going to sleep? Oh, how much work is going to be at the end of the night? You know, and all these other things. And all of a sudden, I'm not good at work either. Right. I'm drawn. You know what I mean? And it's enabled me to focus. It's enabled me to take time to study and do research on other techniques and other moves I want to implement. Uh, maybe a teaching plan. It enabled me to go to tournaments and be uh, aware and 100% rested and comfortable as opposed to working the night before getting one hour of sleep, going to a tournament. One hour? Literally one hour. Jesus and then, Christ, listen, man. I would do a tournament all day, go right to work, work all night long, <clears throat> off an hour of sleep the night before, and then do it again the next day because there would be another tournament or a fight. <clears throat> I don't know how. I mean, I was pretty heavily marijuana medicated <laughs> most of the time. but Seems like it wouldn't help at all. <laughs> no, I'm a doer. Like, when I get stoned, I don't get, yeah. like, uh, I'm going to lay around. I, I do everything. Okay. But it, it was hard, man. I mean, but you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool, man. You, you got yourself in a position where you don't have to do that anymore. Lucky for us. Yes. <laughs> no no more drink pouring. I hated bartending. Bouncing was cool. Bartending sucks. How long were you bartending for? About a year, year and a half. Oh, okay. Not that long. But you, you've been a bouncer for a long time, right? Yeah, bouncer and strip club DJ. <laughs> <laughs> I heard your strip club DJ voice today, man. You busted it out. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's in there, man. It's in there. This could be useful for your uh, Friday night fights. <laughs> yeah. You're going to do some announcing. I'll just announce, yeah. 
<laughs> In this corner, sugar. <laughs> Give us all nicknames. I don't have any nicknames, man. I'm more than more than uh, willing to have a stripper nickname. Yeah. If you know uh, any good Marshall? ones. If you know any good ones, there's no rush. Let's call you Eminem. M and M's. I think we could do better. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> sex machine. I use that one a lot. Sex machine. Yeah. That's just a hot name. Think about it. Here it comes applies, sex machine. It applies to everybody. Yeah, yeah. There would just be that question. Uh, be like, oh, is he? Yeah, like, exactly. You know, it's very rare that you know someone well enough to be like, well, actually, he's not. Yeah, like, yeah. I no, know. no, I don't it's think a I lie. Knew that well. Yeah. You can put out, like the most <laughs> weird motherfucker out there, right? And you call him sex machine, and some girls can be like, hmm, is he? Is Whoa. he? Yeah. Interesting. He must. Why then? What, it's all then, in the he, name. Is he rich? Does he have an uncle? What? How did he? And all of a sudden, it's true. What's funny is a lot of that's <laughs> true, though. Like the, with the name, mm-hmm. if they had a good name, it would be a good opener for a customer and them to talk. Okay. And then once you get the opener, the girl should be able to close and get some money out of them. Okay. That's what a lot of guys don't see in the strip club. It's a fucking business. It is a business, and there's a hustle going on from the moment you open your wallet to give the doorman your ID. Yeah, that's why I've always been scared of them, man. I've been in like maybe three strip clubs. Yeah, when and I never really enjoyed it. Put it this way: when I'd work the door. The moment you open your wallet, I'm looking to see what kind of credit cards you have and if you have any money in there. Okay. Interesting. And if you have a bunch of money, I get on the radio, and I'll be like, find Sugar, let her know that dude in the, the front row is uh, is stacked. Oh, interesting. If she makes money off him, she'll come break you off. Okay. Okay. And so I'm sure that's like most bouncers. It's not just you. <laughs> no, that yeah, that was taught to me. That was okay. taught to me. Yeah, that's every bouncer. That's, if you're good. Like, yeah. You know? So I show up with like six dollars and <laughs> yeah, you're you're. They'll probably find smile. a reason to throw you out. Actually, <laughs> they'll be like waiting, like that dude just sitting to the stage, not tip and get him Racist out of here. Racist motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> throw me out for political reasons. And you were jerking off in there. <laughs> what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, talk me into not going back to strip because I went to a bachelor party recently, man, and we got strippers in the hotel room, and even that was terrible. Well, those what are called hookers, this? dude. Yes. <laughs> There's no strippers that go to rooms. Those are hookers. No, we're just dancers. You're fucking lying. Okay, so if they're hookers, then we only got the appetizer. <coughs> yeah. I guess we didn't. <laughs> well, we didn't make it rain enough. Yeah, you gotta pull out the the money for that one. I didn't spend any money. I was the only one. Smart man. <laughs> Smart man. I was like, yeah, you can stick that candle in your pussy if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Paid my ex-wife a hundred grand. That was enough. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred grand's a nice. Nice amount of money. How, how long did that take to pay? Hundred grand. A long time. <laughs> yeah, just just this year I have paid it off, and now I am comfortable. Ah, nine months ago I got paid off. Yeah, don't mar- don't marry a stripper. <laughs> yeah, nine months ago, don't marry strippers. Noted. Yeah. I will continue not meeting and or marrying strippers. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> Sounds like I'm on the right path. Yeah. Okay. What are these big questions I got for you? I don't even know what this means, man. I'm so bad at writing. Um, that looks like a bird and a and a, and a dragon. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if birds and dragons got along. I don't know. Sorry. Um, birds are dragons. How about that? <sighs> Very possible. How about yeah. that? All right. So Casey Halstead. When did you meet him? I met Casey Halstead years ago at De La O Jiu Jitsu. What, what's the name of it? De La O Jiu Jitsu. De La O. Yeah, it's where I got my first black belt in the gi from John De La O. Is that near here? Uh, it's in uh, Stanton. Is off that? of Catella. It's near Anaheim, kind of. Knott's Berry Farmish area. Okay. <clears throat> um, Casey came in. I was a student there. I was one of the instructors. And uh, Casey and I were friends from then on. You came, were already a black belt? Yeah, I believe so. Black or brown. Okay. Yeah, when he came in, I believe. And uh, he trained there for years. And he's always tough, dude. Yeah. He fought there. Um, and then I had a falling out and left the school. And then he had a falling out and left the school. Okay. And I had... Common theme with De La O? uh, Well, um, he's a very um, strong-willed man. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some people it works. For some people, if you're strong-willed too, which Casey is. Of course. um, And I was trying to be at the time, you know. I'm a little more passive. But, uh, you know, we'd be butt heads. And it's his way or the highway pretty much. And he has every right to be that way. So we left. And Fair enough. I had started mine, my school, and I had three students, <laughs> maybe two. And uh, Casey came over to hang out and train with us. We had Ghetto Joe was a mutual friend of ours. He was one of my students. And uh, Casey's like, oh, I'm checking out other schools. He was checking out some of the bigger schools around. 
And he could have gone to any of them, mm -hmm. but for some reason he decided to stick around at Subtech okay. with me. And it, it honestly, it's like I've never said it to him, but it was it was uh, motivating to me and like touching because he could have gone to any school. And I had this little ass school with like fucking ten feet of mat and you know a big octagon thing in the middle that was too small <laughs> and weights and you know what I mean. It was not the <laughs> ideal training facility, but it was what it was, and it, it was a, it was a start. And uh, Casey stuck with me, and then he he ended up being my partner, dude, you know? And uh, we got things up and running, got it going. That's Without cool. him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have accomplished what we've accomplished because, um, like I said, I'm not the best businessman. I'm very creative, artistic. I love teaching. But uh, Casey really brought to the table, like, this is how we should do it and why, and, and made it um, functional, you might say. You know what I mean? Back in the day, I'm like, oh, you're going to train this month? Yeah, coach, I don't have all the money. Okay, whatever, just give me what you got. And it, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I was too nice. Yeah. And that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And Casey really brought a good, strong business sense to the... To like, no, the, take their money. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it was cool. It was, it, was, it was cool that he came and he, he hung out there and chose to train with us and, and together and Andy Balmore. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to do this and have 10th Planet Orange County, you know, pretty much, Vegas. So how long have you been with 10th Planet? Uh, four or five years, okay. four years. Yeah, I think. Do nice. the math. Yeah, same, me and Casey, same time. But I was already doing Tenth Planet before that. Like, I was a closet Tenth Planet guy okay. at, <laughs> at the at De La O because I had coached against Eddie, and uh, his guys beat my guys, mm -hmm. and it happened a couple times to where I had no answer to the rubber guard. I mean, right. I don't think anybody did back in the day, and uh, <clears throat> I started investigating. I had some VHS tape. That had Eddie's matches on it. I remember <laughs> someone had given it to me. I don't know if it was one of the guys from Tap Out or someone gave it to me. And I remember I watched it. Like a spy. Yeah, yeah. Someone just had like, <laughs> it was like his tournament footage. And then I got another one he did that was like a fake MTV crib that had more of his footage on it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I started watching it, playing around with it. And I bought his first book, like Jiu Jitsu Unleashed. And it was like this little, little book. Mm -hmm. And I started working a rubber guard. And uh, all of a sudden I wasn't getting hit as much in MMA. I'd be training and I'd be working, you know, just mission control to New York, you know? The most basic of rubber guards. Yeah, that's yeah. all I did. I would do basic path and I wasn't getting hit. I'd leave class, I'd have a clean nose, no, no bloody nose, no fat lips. And I was just able to clinch and control because a lot of my teammates were better wrestlers than me and I got taken down a lot. So I'd be playing off my back and the rubber guard just seemed to work. So uh, I secretly started delving into that dark said you might say mm -hmm. and during class I'd be teaching and my instructor would leave the room and I'd be like everybody look and I'd like show him a rubber guard move or maybe like the electric chair or something you know what I mean right. and then uh, we'd all be drilling it he'd come back in about stop 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 stop, stop. <laughs> we'd all stop and go back to like the guard pass we were working or whatever and after a while he knew you know and he, uh, he actually let me teach it to some of the guys Okay. and, and uh, he wasn't very willing you know but he, he was willing enough to he used to call it the condom guard or the prophylactic guard. <laughs> so uh, I would teach that to the guys. It's also a pretty good name. Yeah. So when we so had, <laughs> it is. When we had the when we had the falling out, I remember I was sitting on my toilet and I was on the computer and I was on Eddie's website and I'm all, "Where's his school at?" And I looked at it. And I'm all, "Fuck, I can train there." And in my head, I'm like, "You can train there." You know, I was like, "What's stopping you? You don't have an instructor to tell you what to do anymore." I was already a black belt, so ended up making some connections and little by little. Made my way up to headquarters and got to roll with Eddie Bravo. Nice. Yeah. That's cool, man. That's next. That's a step. It's somewhere in my future as I'll be there. I'll yeah. head up there. But I'm nervous, man. Don't be. It's cool. There's a bunch of killers up there. Yeah. You put the fear of God in me and we're like, yeah, you got into the warm-ups. And I looked up the warm-ups and I was like, Jesus Christ. There's how a lot. I got to learn these by myself. Like, yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, learn, like, each warm-up's like 16 moves. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically the idea is this. Once you memorize all the warm-ups, you should be pretty competent at the 10th planet system. Mm -hmm. You should be pretty aware of every position, whether it's a bunch or a little, you have touched on everything pretty much if you do all those warm-ups. And you should be pretty, pretty tight jujitsu guy, you know, or yeah. bro. Yeah, I really like him, man. Just since I, I've been doing them like three weeks or so. Like yeah. he told me to do them, and then Casey told me I had to learn them. Yeah. And so the combination of that like put me on like a little, I didn't sleep for weeks, Ron. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, you feel my pain, man. I watch so much jujitsu videos, it's retarded. And I'm you not still like, do? 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have to. Like this whole leg lock game, uh-huh. uh, you have to study. You have to study it. And I'm not one to go and jump ahead. I want to make sure I get something dialed in and mastered, and then move ahead and dial in and master the next piece. I'd rather have one nuclear bomb than a bunch of switchblade knives. Yeah, you that's know? something I, I keep that you told me that I keep writing down. It's come up in my notebook like a bunch of times. It's something about like a a well-rounded fighter is a mediocre fighter. Something yeah. along those lines. It's not like something you'd say. Yeah, there's a lot of MMA schools out there. And when I hear MMA school, I train at such and such MMA. Cool, that's great. But I believe you're a master of none. Mm-hmm. You know, you're kind of okay at kicking, okay at striking, you're okay at wrestling, you're okay at jiu-jitsu, and you're dangerous probably, right? But why not be a motherfucking murderer at one of them? You know what I mean? Right. Like, you know if you go to the ground with, with like, say, Nate Diaz. Mm-hmm. You better fucking learn to swim, dude. That fool's going to submit you. It's just a matter of time. You know? You get uh, Damian Maya. <laughs> you go to the ground with him, guess what? You're fucking done. Yeah, if you're going against Damon Maya and you don't go to the ground with him, you're going to the ground with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that that's that's what I believe you should do is, at first, try to get one thing that's yours, that you own, that you're a master of, that you know once you get there, you get this overwhelming confidence, like, oh, you're mine. You and yeah, so I was trying to think of, like, a, a successful UFC guy who's not a killer in one thing. And yeah. the only thing I really think of is like maybe like Rory McDonald, who's like really good at everything, but you know he's not like a knockout artist, not a submission artist. He's but he can do them. Yeah, yeah. He's the only person I can really think. There's about. There, that's what I'm saying. There are those rare occasions where someone comes together, right? But I'm sure even him, like his coaches, <coughs> disagree. They be like, dude, have you seen? I, I yeah. don't know. He's doing something. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh. That's my belief, and that was passed on from my instructor John. Actually, back in the day, he was like, "You, you know, we're jujitsu fighters. You know what I mean? We finish people on the ground. It didn't matter who you were. If you had great striking, you better take them down and finish them." Okay. But uh, you know, and that, that's the way it is. You, I, I know when I get a triangle, even if it's loose, that I'm gonna finish it in my head against anybody. I'm like, I got this fucker, you know, because I'm I'm so confident. I've been there so many times. I've mastered that movement in my mind. I'm still improving on it, but I mean that that's my shit. Mm-hmm. You know, and I I truly believe that if you're a fighter you should have something that is yours. Whether it be stand up or on the ground or, or whatever. That ability to just end it when it needs to be ended, you know? And of course you're gonna run into guys that are as good as you or whatnot, but it's you natural. Do, yeah, I think you do need that. You have to be a master mm. and build those little foundations, you know. Like for years I did the same moves when I started jujitsu. For years and years and years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, from triangle chokes to arm lock to guillotine, the rear naked choke to, you know, there was there was a lot of moves, but it ended up being after a while, you know, I pretty much had a grasp of everything, and it was the repetitions and the refining of it, and those little nuances um, are what make the moves better, you know? It's like, a, I, was, I said this earlier um, today, I think, it's like a clock, you know, you turn that clock around. All you got to do is take one little piece out of that clock and the whole thing's jacked up and it doesn't work. Same thing with the technique, you know. Maybe the, the hip is wrong. Maybe if you turn your hand this way, there's no pressure on the elbow anymore. You know, all of these little things, the little microscopic movements um, that you realize in a heartbeat in an instant, that's what's important, you know. Because, like, you could be aware, oh, if I turn my hand this way, but what about just doing these little movements automatically without thinking of them? Yeah, that's you know? the goal, huh? That's like that that <coughs> secret jujitsu that, that that you can't really teach is that touch sensitivity. It's knowing when something's there or when it's not. Um, I think about how I feel now when I roll, and a guy like Jean Jacques who's got like double the time I do, you know, or how he must feel when he rolls. I see him roll with people that are really good, and he'll just it's like effortless, mm-hmm. right? And uh, yeah, like I like Hicks and Gracie. You know what is their sensitivity like? What are they? Th- what are they feeling? And what are they? How are they responding in their head? It's such a high level, you know, of a uh, of movement. It's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it appears there's nothing going on in their head. Yeah, but yeah. In, you know, in reality, it's probably like a checklist that just went off like instantaneously that he didn't even think of that his body is just aware of. You know, it's like when you're coding, uh, they say I don't know how deep into coding this is like, but basically it's all if and statements. Uh-huh. If he does this, then this. If you do this, then this. If if the foot's here, then move it. If it's not there, then you're seeing yeah. pass. If and it's just that, it's just you grow through. And I'd say these guys are just doing a thousand of them at once. Yeah. If his hands like this, if his lo- grip is loose, if his fingers are. 
It's I almost like taking a stack of index cards that have information <laughs> on them and just like flipping through them as fast as you can. If mm-hmm. not faster, you know, their head is just done. Yeah. You know? Like when you uh, pull out your iPhone right now and it does something as opposed to like if you went back to the 60s and those clunky ass computers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tried Googling in the 60s. Like, yeah, that's no like shit, what huh? a lot of, That's what I'm trying to do. Like, <laughs> it's these guys. You're Googling in the 60s. <laughs> Damn it, this footlock's like Googling in the 60s. It's all right, I'll just triangle choke Jean-Jacques Machado real fast. <laughs> yeah, man. That's what's crazy is, you know, even science fiction movies didn't get the iPhones right. Oh, yeah, there's Dude, no way. Captain Kirk was pushing on a fucking walkie-talkie on his chest. <laughs> like, no visual readout, nothing. You know what I mean? No it's like, time. hello, hey. <laughs> you mean I can look at this thing and see his picture? Yeah. You know, no one even thought of that. Even Crazy. on Star Wars. Well, Star Wars happened a long time ago, actually. And it, was it far away or close by? The galaxy? Far away. Yeah? The galaxy far, far away. Oh, okay. Oh, that, that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, you're a bit of a Star Wars buff, eh? I try, I try. Yeah? Yeah, I, since I was little. Yeah? You looking forward to the new ones? Yes. Yes, yeah. I am. As, okay. long, as long as they're not done by George Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did yeah. he do uh, episodes like one, two, and three? Yeah. By George Lucas? He did all of them, but okay. except for the la- the newest one. Right. And uh, I just think he went off in a kind of strange way with those. And I like what they're doing now where being darker and a little more adult. The last one was awesome. Dude, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I only saw it once though. I, I tried talking to my roommate about it. He's like really into Star Wars, and he just like laughed me with knowledge like immediately. Really? Like, Who are you talking about? Like what? Okay. Oh, that's the main dude. Okay. Okay. <laughs> like right now, I can tell you the name of the black dude in Star Wars. Yeah, I saw like, it. The main guy. I saw it twice. Twice. The main guy. Yeah. What's it's, that guy's name? It's Finn. Finn. Okay, that's easy to remember. <laughs> and then, but he was telling me that there's new Star Wars every year now. Is that true? Yeah, you know the next that? one that's coming out is before the Death Star blew up. The next one coming out is like a separate, separate from all those altogether. What the fuck? It's man? about the people stealing the plans that Princess Leia smuggles to have the Death Star blown up. I see. Remember Obi Wan, you're my only hope. Mm-hmm. Those plans that she put in R two D two is what these people are stealing. So it's before all of this. So Darth Vader is going to be in it. This is going deep. It is. <laughs> it is. So, Darth, I, so this is between three and four. It's like three and a half. Episode three yeah, and a half. Kinda, yeah. After episode, what was the last one? Se- seven? Like, <laughs> seven, yeah. It's all fucked up, dude. Yeah. It's all jacked up. <laughs> Instead of going to eight, they're dividing by two. And what gets me, too, is that like these older ones have way better spaceships than the newer ones, supposedly. You know what I mean? Like, like the technology's better. I'm like, wait a second. Did they just fucking... Mm-hmm. How'd they do this? That's what, that lo- loses me about Star Wars The intricacy And, and, and X-Men the same I used to be in the X-Men Yeah And all of a sudden They're splitting universes Yeah and What the fuck dude Yeah I You I know that uh, Who was it G.I. Joe Hasbro has its own universe now You know Marvel has theirs So all these toy companies Are doing exactly What Transformers did Or what uh, You know what I mean And they're branding Their, their set of toys Like I heard They're going to come out With a uh, there were these cars when I was a kid, and they had like little aliens in one, and you could put different parts on the cars. They're interchangeable. Make these monster cars. It was a cartoon. Okay. Wheeled Warriors. They're coming out with Wheeled Warriors car, or TV show or movie or whatever. So like Hasbro. Um, who did Scooby Doo? Hanna Barbera. I don't know. And they did all these other cartoons. They're coming out their own brand. So, movie industry is uh, getting kind of crazy right now. <laughs> As I'm taking it the other way, man. I've talked on this podcast before about. Um, all these independent movies I see at UCI. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've just been going complete. Like, I don't want to see another Marvel movie. Like, I'm done. You're done with all the... I'm done, dude. I, I checked out at Captain America 1. I was like, why am I... I know how this ends. I'm, I'm done. And it's just that, that formulaic... But it makes it sense, is. man. Like, because I lived in Asia. Like, I know how much money these guys are making. Yeah. <laughs> it's craziness. Like, in Asia, man, like, all these movies are selling a million backpacks. Like, that's something you don't yeah. really think about. All the, dude, all the toys. Shoes. All the toys, the shoes, the fucking keychains, the mm-hmm. Big Macs with fucking boxes with Iron Man on them. Uh-huh. It's, uh, it is money. I see that. I don't like that shit too much. They're making pencils. Yeah. <laughs> what I like is happening now is, like, Netflix and these, these companies are coming out with their own shows. Yeah. And it's, it's a uh, good sign. Yeah, because why can't we cuss on TV? Right? Right. Yeah. You know, I was watching uh, Kill Bill in the scene with, uh... Lucy Liu She's on the table And she had just cut off The Yakuza's head 
and she's like, so listen, you know, and she's very calm, and she's like, I'll fucking cut your head off. And when she said fucking, it's all, how flaming, da da da. And I was like, no. And it totally ruined the weight of that scene and like the, how powerful it was and how crazy it made her look. Yeah. You know what I mean? I hate when they do that because yeah. it turns into a shitty movie. I can't watch it. I just flip it off and go. And it seems unnecessary. It is because yeah. we've all said fuck, we've all said shit. Come on, we're not kids. I think another thing that's like a way in the past is people not being able to admit drug use. Like yeah. on the news, or yeah. like, you know what I mean, like or sexual infidelity. <laughs> yeah, like it's a new thing. Oh, I guess Obama admitted he smoked weed. That was like a big step. <laughs> but uh, like to have a, a guy who's president who's like, yeah, I, I'm a guy. I'm powerful. I have testosterone. I fuck a lot. What do you want? What do you want from me? It was all in the same thing. It's the yeah, same. it's like, dude, I'm just like you. I'm just like you. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like you. You know. Yeah. So yeah, <clears throat> I agree, and that's why. Um, I will beep all of your cusses on this show. Okay. But I'll replace them with Chinese. But it'll be tasteful, you know. It'll be like philosophical. It'll be Taoist quotes. It'll be. Um, How about a guttural Chinese man? Like, oh, God, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Every time Mo- I cuss. Mongolian throat singing. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, why does Ron keep clearing his throat? Why is it a seven-second singing when he cuss for one second? <laughs> like, <laughs> you just like the song. the time. <laughs> <laughs> Cuts out half of what I said. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I have any more questions for you, man. I wrote down 30 of them. Would you like to read any of them? Let's see here. The we, did, we didn't get through. Let me do any I of can't them. read. <laughs> Longevity in jiu-jitsu. Diet, yeah, bouncing, uh, street fights, ex-wife, <laughs> kids. Uh, draws well. <laughs> Does that say psychedelic or crocodiles? Um, probably psychedelics. Are you a fan? Uh, y- yes. Yeah. I don't do them too much. I do them as uh, needed. I haven't done mushrooms in a long time. Okay. But uh, weed and mushrooms, I have OCD really bad. Okay. When I say OCD really bad, I'm not saying that everything has to be in order and it's very clean. Like, that's part of it. I'm one of those guys that touches a doorknob 500 times and he can't leave his house. Um this is like every day you deal with this? Not anymore. I, oh. I deal with it on a smaller level now. I got a lot, it's a lot more under control. Okay. And I understand mentally why I do it. It's a control mechanism. I think I control a situation by doing these things. Okay. Um, but through weed and psychedelics, for the first time in my life when I did mushrooms and when I smoked weed, I stopped thinking the mm. thoughts that were in my head that were making me do these uh, compulsive, the compulsive behavior. And everything was okay. Right, because the biggest fear you have is that if you don't do this thing, something bad is going to happen. Right? Mm. We call this in Buddhism Satori. Satori. You had a Satori moment where I realized the the, the veil of illusion was wiped away real quick. Yeah, you yeah. saw. And uh, I think without yeah. it, I would be in. A, it would be horrible. When I was younger, dude, um, for everybody in the world to know, there were times I get in and out of bed probably five hundred times. Literally standing up. Yeah, I'd be back dripped down. in drenched in sweat. Same with the bathtub or a shower. Like it was very, it was very hard growing up being a kid. Um, I went through it a lot. It was because my mom was sick and there was a lot of shit going on. You know, I saw right but, stuff uh, you couldn't control. Yeah, but see yeah. through these habits, it uh-huh. felt like a sense of control, right? Interesting. Yeah. So when I did the psychedelics, you know, you have that <laughs> moment where you go, you get real, real deep in within yourself, mm-hmm. and I kind of realized, well, hey, I'm not doing that shit right now, and everything's okay. And, you know, it took some time, a couple more times and everything like that, but then it became to where I, it was manageable, you know what I mean? Yeah, crazy. You can learn the lesson but not apply it. Yeah. Like, almost always, right? Yeah. Like, what you guess is what jiu-jitsu is. You show us how to do the move perfectly, and no one's going to do it perfectly. Yeah, it takes same time. Same thing with psychedelics. They'll come in and tell you, like, no, you don't have to get out of bed 500 times. Yeah. But you still might, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's just kind of the way it goes, right? That's the natural process of it. Um, so how old were you when you when you realized this? When, when you I had that mushroom trip and I was probably <clears throat> in my twenties when that happened. Okay. I'd, I'd gotten control over it younger, but uh, it was still prevalent. I just hid it from people pretty good. Uh-huh. But yeah, when I I had tripped a few times and uh, it just made sense, you know. Like I I just realized, you know, and smoking too. Smoking weed is is really what was enabling me to, to see everything's okay if you don't do that stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Do you think that helped you out with, like, weightlifting or something? Like, you lift a weight a lot? <laughs> have, to lift, have to lift more? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Like, you just do more reps. No, I do think that's why I was drawn to jiu-jitsu. Really? Because while I was training, you can't think of anything else. True. I can't do some little nuance or habit because 
if I move my hand, he'll get control of my, my collar. Or you know what I mean? Like there's uh-huh. so much going on. You have to be in the moment with jujitsu. Can't be picking your nose. I mean, I, that's why I like it. I believe in jujitsu. My dojo is like a, a zombie safe house. All the shit that goes on in the world is out those doors. Mm. Whether it's your bills, your wife, your kid, a uh, fucked up job. But once you walk through those doors, you have to do jujitsu. You have to focus on the movements. You have to roll with the other people. You're in co- a constant battle, right? Whether you're trying to learn or whether you're you're rolling and actually rolling. All those problems you have, you're not thinking of them. You're thinking of, fuck, he's got my back. i got to counter this, grab the hand, got to get to the other side, out of the bucket, scrape him off, got to move. Oh, he's mounted me. You know what I mean? You're, you're in the moment. Mm-hmm. And then when it's all said and done, then you can go leave and deal with the demons that are outside those doors and zombies and shit, you know? Yeah, it's always a strange thing when someone brings their demons on. Yeah. You're, like, drilling with someone, and they're like, you can tell they're dude, kinda... my girlfriend. Like, what? What? You, what? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that sucks, dude. Yeah, get back to jiu-jitsu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, like, sounds like it sounds rude, right, to yeah. someone who doesn't do jiu-jitsu. Yeah. But I, I honestly believe, man, like, that that is the best thing for them. Because, or else you could say, like, all right, let's meditate, like, focus on your breath. They're like, what? What do you, yeah. what? Or you could say, okay, let's do some stretching. Let's stand on one foot and your girlfriend probably will go away. Yeah. Or you'll fall over. Well, it's, it's all about, I was listening to, uh, that on Joe Rogan, he had this guy on there. He's a kickboxing commentator. He's Irish, but he's also a sports uh, therapist. Vinny Sherman. Yeah, Vinny Sherman, yeah. Sherman. And he was talking about when you're nervous, instead of focusing on whatever you're focusing on, like say you're in a tournament and you're about to go wrestle this person in front of you, mm-hmm. and you're looking at him and you're like, fuck, they're going to take me down. He's so big, he's buff. Start focusing on everything around them, too. Look at the crowd. Look at the mat look at the the venue mm-hmm. because all of a sudden now you're having to recognize these things and instead of you thinking death 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 you're like oh that guy has a blue shirt over there yeah, they got hot dogs over there you know what i mean and all of a sudden you're taking that 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 away a little bit you know what yeah, i mean yeah that, then that that's the image that Aldous huxley used in uh doors of perception yeah that famous psychedelic book he's talking about how like the human attentiveness like on the savannah you can't be looking at everything Right, you have to be focused and worried about one thing at a time. You can't be running from a tiger and look at flowers. And so <laughs> we have that, like, um, like a sink faucet on a very low setting. It's just dripping a little bit, and psychedelics open up that faucet and let it all flood in. And then you're not just thinking about how annoying the machines are on the podcast. Yeah. You're also like, you know, like, whoa, these fucking flowers, no way. Yeah. Which is why, like, have you ever hiked? in a group of like half people tripping half people sober it, you don't go anywhere because yeah. the people on mushrooms are like Jesus Christ this rock yeah and they're like yeah I don't know I wasn't thinking about that <laughs> I, was in, I went to Hawaii when I was younger and we all took mushrooms on this trip it was a bunch of bartenders and stuff I got to go with and uh, one of my best friends at the time we, we went and we ate the mushrooms and the guy that took us was from there right we just happened to run into him and he made us leave our shoes behind we did it barefoot and what that did is it made us all take the the walk a little slower and you had to kind of look where you were going to step so it made you pay attention more to everything you know what I mean and uh, it worked out pretty good mm-hmm. you know like you can't just truck through because you got shoes on you have to like oh I'm going to step over here on this rock and over here now I will say this a couple hours into it I was plastered on a bunch of jagged rocks like twister like one foot over here one hand over here mm-hmm. every time I'd breathe in Everything was crystal clear. When I'd breathe out, it would go all blurry and fucked up. <laughs> it took me like 30 minutes to traver- traverse these rocks to this waterfall. Mm-hmm. I probably could have died, like literally. I was shaking, you know, I felt like Spider Man with yeah. muscle fatigue kicking in. <laughs> Somehow I made it. That's cool, man. And so that, that slowing down process, that taking and looking around, that's called mindfulness in Buddhism. That's what they call it. And the whole point is that if you do that with everything, it gets better. You know what I mean? That's why I like this tea ceremony, the tea that I'm making you. It's a little complicated, right? There's yeah. some steps involved, and that's to make you pay attention. I can't just be sitting here like thinking like, oh, I'm blowing this podcast, these machines are going off, Jesus Christ, and then make a cup of tea. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't really work that way. Same way if you're rolling a joint. You can't be like dancing or like... Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You gotta you focus right there. Yeah, you get something... Fo- you can't be like looking at the sitcom or whatever bullshit thing that like <laughs> takes half your attention away. You can't be like, rolling a joint on jagged rocks because both those things require mindfulness and yep. the mind only has so much attention to put in places. Yeah. You know. You know. You know what I mean. You right. know. 100%. <laughs> My mind right now is that the predator over there is making a lot of noise. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's really annoying. I apologize, to people listening. I wish there's like, way I could take that out. I don't know. Street fights, jujitsu books. What's this say here? <laughs> Netflix. No, I'm not gonna watch Netflix with you. You can ask over and over again. <laughs> Only leaves the one thing. Yeah, the thing is, like that notebook. It's not all about you. Those. Are <laughs> that's that's me. That's my ego. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, re- uh, I write all my jokes in that book as well. I've been so in I'm a lot of street I've... fights. Whoa, there's a picture of a penis. Um, <laughs> there's not. I'm kidding everybody. There's not. I mean, not on that page. Yeah. Yeah, I've been <laughs> been in a lot of street fights. Had some weapons pulled on me. Been hit with bottles. I got shot at when I was younger by a shotgun. Actually hit the tr- hit the truck. Jesus, the uh, truck that you're driving. Yeah, yeah. Don't honk at gangbangers. Just for <laughs> everybody all knows. You did? Yeah, I know. <laughs> they were swerving. I thought they were drunk, so I honk so they wake up. And okay. then they pulled up next to me and they gave us some dirty looks and they slowed way down and we pulled up to the light. And next thing I know, there's fire coming out the end of the shotgun. Oh shit. Yeah, I saw it and I let my foot off the brake right at the last second and we started rolling. And uh, it hit right in front of the, the passenger rear view mirror. So I think uh, if I didn't hit it, if I didn't let go of the brake, I think it probably would have sprayed us. Jesus Christ, man. Eh, whatever. And that was like, around here? That's that was like in Orange Bakersfield. County? Bakersfield? Yeah, did high school and some college in Bakersfield. Okay. Yeah. Damn, dude. <laughs> Cal- California's hot spot. Different lives we've led, Ron. Yeah. <laughs> have yeah. you ever owned a gun? Um, I grew up with them. My dad always had guns in the house. You would open a cupboard, okay. and there would be a pistol there. Yeah? <laughs> literally, on my couch. Like, in the same spot or in different places? Same spot. Okay. Like, But literally, every room, there was multiple guns you can get to. And my brother and I, my mom, everybody knew how to shoot real well. Okay. But I don't own one now. Your dad, was he hunting at all, or just all? He would hunt. He was, a, he, he was a gun collector. He was a doctor, but he had a big gun collection. Okay. And he used to, like, go on hunting every now and then, go to the gun range. Um... Yeah, yeah, whatever. I just grew up with that, you know, that kind of yeah, southern style. I that, guess I think of that. Yeah, is that my my dad? He's he was born in Mississippi. All his whole family's still down there, and so I'm with them. That's the only place I see houses like that. Yeah, you know, like last time I was in Louisiana, uh, we're hanging out with my cousins. I don't really know them that well, and there's kind of an awkward moment in conversation where like you know, me and you maybe be like, you guys want to smoke weed or you know something like that. You guys want to do some jujitsu? Like, should we just start shooting? Like, yeah, yeah, we should, let's start shooting, yeah. All right, I'll get the beer, let's go. And oh, we wow. just all got shotguns and, like... <laughs> and we went out and did it, huh? <laughs> yeah, like, just, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's one thing we could do. Yeah, let's go do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a problem with people having guns. I just, you know, it's, uh, I don't have one. Okay. I have samurai swords and shit like that. Do you? <laughs> yeah. How many swords do you have? Uh, I got a, a samurai sword and I have a bunch of knives. Okay. I have this death knife that, like, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. Okay You, uh, you actually, hide them in cupboards Like your dad No It's right next to the bed Okay Yeah if you come in You're getting chopped up <laughs> It's like this You come in my house You probably and, and I live And you don't You're gonna live But you'll be fucked up Okay Probably like a jiu-jitsu clinic Noted, Noted. Yeah All Not right. you personally <laughs> I'd probably like Marshall Anybody what, what are you doing here Anybody <laughs> listening Yeah Have you had someone Break into your house I had this big like Night chest in front of my Bedroom window and one night I was asleep and I heard boom and like this dude tried to open a window and jump through but he jumped into the big 500 pound fucking night chest thing <laughs> so I ran out and chased him but he got away whoa yeah that's crazy bro yeah that's why I live in safe places like Taiwan see yeah. how I live there right now yeah, yeah totally <laughs> I live in Santa Ana not very safe there's worse places Ron this is true. This is true. So we've been talking for about an hour, Ron. Okay. I'm running out of steam a little bit. You got my notebook. Where did I meet Carlos? Water. First impressions. I'm kidding. This is Casey. <laughs> Carlos. <laughs> yeah, when did you meet Carlos? What was your first impression of Casey? Did he have a beard back then? No. He's a nice uh, beard. Oh, no. He's a nice mustache now. Casey has always been a hardworking, like, stand-up dude. Yeah. Like, what you see is what you get, yeah. If he says he's going to be there at 10, he's there at 9.45. Um. Yeah, I mean, you, you what you see is what you get. Casey's been Casey since, since the jump. I mean, That's you know, cool. yeah. Nice, dude. Brings me lots of pleasure. Well, thank you for being here today, Ron. You're, You're a great welcome. guest. Thank I love you for you the tea. All my heart. Oh, I tea love ran too. out. 
I wish we maybe we could have gone longer in the podcast if I'd gotten some water. But God damn it, Ron, you're so entertaining, I couldn't leave. It happens, it happens. I wanted to walk away, and I couldn't. I have dance lessons in a second anyway. So. <laughs> no, not really. I have zero rhythm. <laughs> zero. It's a good way to get some, man. Get yeah. you on a capoeira. We'll do some of that. Yeah, I pop lock. Do you? <laughs> Bring it back to fucking 80s b-boy style. <laughs> okay. Just going to pop lock. Maybe uh, the little mime, little wall. You like that? You like that? Okay. Look. Oh, open the door. Who's nice. here? It's Ron. Yeah. Shut it. If anybody listening wants to know what I did, <laughs> I, just did I just did that mime movement with the fake wall. Then I opened the door, waved at Marshall, and shut it. He was blown away. That's why he's silent. He's laughing now. <laughs> it was very well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, All thanks right. for listening, guys. Take care. Goodbye. We have so much background sound. Tell me who are these men that are coming on. We have background sound. That's the way it has to be. Rex Nelson, my friend, I've called you here today for this impromptu podcast because... Spur of the moment. It is now <coughs> August 4th, 2016. It's been one year since I've been back in America, Rex. Do you know that? Exactly one year. 367 days. Nice. Yeah, man. Back from Taiwan. I was just t- sitting here in the backyard with my friend Rex. He just got off work. I'm sitting here drinking tea. Talking about being in Taiwan. I was there. How long do you think I was there, Rex? One and a half years. Very good guess. I was there one and a half years. <laughs> and we're just talking about it, and you don't know much about like what I was doing. or like I haven't really tried to talk about it too much. Like, Where did you spend your first year in Asia? Let's go back a little further. So when I went to Asia, I went there right out of college, like right as soon as I graduated. I had a one-way flight to Taiwan. That was the first place I ever went. Yeah. And straight to Taipei. And last there two months, and then spent six months backpacking around. In Taipei? Uh, sorry. So I was in Taipei for about like a week, uh-huh. and then went all around Taiwan for two months. Yeah. And then I left Taiwan for the next six months before returning and okay. living there a year and a half. Okay. So you're gone for a year total then, right? Two years. Two years? Oh, two years. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly two years. Yeah. And it's been exactly one year since the two years, Rex. Okay. It's madness. It's been quite a year. Mm-hmm. It's been quite a year. It really has, man. I had a great time living in San Diego for about six months. I guess I've been back here for, I guess, six months. I don't know. Really? My, my yeah, 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 yeah. About six exact. months, yeah. Yeah. It's some estimating. I came down around last December. Yeah, right before you moved out. Mm-hmm. That was fun. Saw Tom Rhodes comedy show. <laughs> I saw Tom Rhodes at the Hoya Comedy Store. The funniest man in the world. He walks around. He, <laughs> when he turns his back on the audience, he's got a big bald spot. He's like, yeah. Sorry, guys, don't want you to see my breakdancing injury. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was, <laughs> it was funny, man. That was funny. But yeah, dude, I was sitting here, cause the reason this came up in our conversation is we've been talking about travel for a long time. I'm always thinking about traveling, where I'm going to go next, where <laughs> I have been. And then I try to, selfishly, I try to get people to travel to places that I've been. <laughs> it's not a very logical thing, but I'm like, oh, you want to go somewhere? You should go somewhere that I like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this will be a good spot. As if I there's like not it. like a thousand million other good spots to travel. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, man. So Taiwan. What do you know about Taiwan, Rex? All I know is that they are, I know they're fighting China for independence. That's, True. And that's about all I really know about it. It's been an ongoing thing, I I guess I mm-hmm. gather for quite a, for quite some time. I under, I think, um, but I really have no <laughs> idea. It, it goes it, here. Here's my understanding of the situation, Rex. It goes back to the communist revolution <clears throat> in China. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I don't know when the last emperor was, but lo, oh, close like to a hundred f- years ago, eighty to a hundred years ago, then was, emperor. I think the communist revolution was like forty. It was like in the forties and or fifties or something like 40s, that. Forties, yeah. Forties, yeah. Yeah, and so before that, so there's a lot of upheaval right before the communists came into the picture. Right. Chiang Kai-shek was one of the guys who was reading, leading the. Uh, I don't want to say the name of the party. That's where I get stuff wrong. <laughs> he was leading a popular party yeah. in China, <laughs> and the communists came up. Oh, no, no, not, not Chiang Kai-shek. Sun Yat-sen. Yeah. Yeah. Sun Yat-sen oh. was leading the party, doing quite well. The communists came over, fucked under, them all up. Under Mao Zedong. The communists under Mao Zedong came in, fucked up yeah. Sun Yat-sen. Chiang Kai-shek took that thing, went to Taiwan, and made a pretty nice place. So yeah. in China, and the communists came in, they, they like... Um, 
destroyed all the culture and stuff that made China such a great place. China had been like one of the top countries for like a long time, right? Yeah. It's just like an empire civilization. It all fell apart with the communists. They started burning art, started murdering martial artists, murdered all their scientists. Made really bad moves. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> but what happened was a lot of the cool parts of China exited out to Taiwan. That's where all the art is. That's where all the martial arts is. That's where a lot of the tea, the tea culture went there. Yeah. Was and tea so, illegal in communist China? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't heard anything about what they're doing with tea, but yeah. like through the capitalist efforts of China in the past long time, the tea industry has been, um, it, it's just soiled. Like it, it's, they use a lot of chemicals to try and get a lot of production. Yeah. Um, and whereas tea in its traditional form is a very slow process. Yeah. That's why there's not a lot of money in it. Like it used to be to drink a cake of poor, you've seen it poor, like the, the, the tea that comes in a cake, mm -hmm. it ages and you would not drink it for 70 years after production. Wow. In a capitalist society, you want to move yeah. it very quickly. You don't have 70 <laughs> years to wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So that's just an example of how like they had to speed up the process and yeah. when, and so tea, it often comes from mountains and so the highest elevation tea is the most prized. So that's where they put the most effort towards. So if you're chemically, um, or if you're using chemicals to produce that tea at the top of the mountain, mm -hmm. it goes down the mountain, so the rest of the plants on the mountain are now poisoned. Yeah. This has been a big issue. Even in Taiwan, Taiwan has that issue where right. they're poisoning some of their famous tea mountains. Right. Yep, that's what we're drinking today. Yeah. This was a gift. We had a friend go to Taipei like two weeks ago, and she brought us this tea back. Nice. It was very nice of her. So let's come back about 70 years into the future, the okay. present. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so you, after you left, you spent about a week in Taiwan. And you spent six months. Where did you move, go after that six months to? I went to Indonesia. Yeah. And hung out in Bali and Gili Taronga for a month. Okay. And then from there, I was just, I, what, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to go kickbox in Thailand, but I was really scared. I was really scared. Dude. I came up with every excuse. Yeah. I was like, no, I should be in shape first, or I should know how to do it, or I should. I just went through all of the normal excuses. Yeah. And then I read a book about a guy who went to Bangkok and just joined a Muay Thai gym. He wasn't in shape, didn't know anything. And then I went, fuck it. And I went and did that. And the whole okay. the whole conclusion came to me while scuba diving in Indonesia. Because scuba diving is so dumb. It's like, <laughs> <Really>? it's, <laughs> I mean, it, so once you're down there and you're below the ocean and you're looking at shit, it's dope. Yeah. Like for those moments. But it was like really expensive. Like it, it, yeah. when, you're in a, when you're in a very cheap country and then they're like, yeah, you want know, to do this thing? It's a hundred dollars to learn. Yeah. Jesus Christ. No. <laughs> yeah. But I did. I paid, and I got under there, and I was like, "This is like a month of kickboxing. I should should have been on land throwing yeah. kicks." Yeah. And so that's where my grand conclusion came was in scuba diving, and then so I moved to Thailand for three months, mostly hung out in Chiang Mai at this uh, Muay Thai academy, San Thai Muay Thai in yeah. San Kam Peng, Thailand. Yeah. I was there for about two months or so. Traveled around the country. Thailand's a really big country. Yeah. So I hung out there for a while, went across to Vietnam, hung out there a month, and then uh, ran out of money, moved back to Taiwan to teach. And that's when I stayed there for about a year and a half, just teaching. What'd you teach? English, mostly to small children. Really? Mm-hmm. It was a lot of kindergarten work. Did they know any English already? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, kids learn really fast, mm -hmm. especially languages. If you have, like, a three-year-old and you're speaking to them in three languages, they'll speak three languages. Wow. Yeah, like, they're very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it, so it's almost easier to teach children in that way than, like, I, I had a girl in my other class, she was 13, just getting into English. Yeah. And, you know, she hated it. She hated life. She's a 13-year-old girl. Yeah. And so she just, like, had terrible grammar and just, like, fighting me on everything. Yeah. Like, just out of principle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? That's, like, a really hard student. Like, yeah. what are you going to do? Um, and she was really funny too. Yeah, she made it really hard. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like so you're trying to be mad at her, and you're kind of laughing at yeah, the same time. Yeah, she was time. hilarious. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like one time, like we were, we were, I was just trying to get through this lesson, and all the kids they have to wear like certain shoes inside and outside. All uh -huh. Asians have two pairs of shoes at all times uh -huh. for outside and inside. And this girl, she's so happy. She with perfect timing as I'm standing in front of the room, just yelling at these kids. She raised her foot, goes, "Teacher, no shoe!" <laughs> and like I fell on the floor. I was like, yeah. "That's." The perfect thing to say. <laughs> You're right. New shoe. God damn it. That's <laughs> more important than commas or whatever I was trying to explain. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so for like months, like people just start yelling new shoe in the class. New shoe. Chaos. <laughs> yeah. 
But teaching teaching is a fun job, man. Like I start work at two in the afternoon most days. Yeah. Like I worked four four days a week for four hours each. <laughs> I worked sixteen hours a week and made like plenty of money to live in Taiwan. Wow. Like in a nice place. I had an apartment in Taipei, like right next to a lake. <laughs> wow. It was awesome. Your own room and everything? Mm-hmm. Your in my own room, a big enough room to do yoga in. It was like not huge, but you know, I could spread my arms. Yeah. I had like a dresser, I had a desk, I had a okay. bed. Did you have your own kitchen? I shared a kitchen with like four Taiwanese guys. Oh, really? Yeah. And they all had their own room as well. Wow. Were so they it was quite a big place. Were they clean? Mm hmm. Very clean. They're clean, they're nice, very nerdy. They'd stay in the room and play video games a lot. <laughs> they're all programmers. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> I know people like that. Yeah. Yeah. They're very nice, very friendly. We'd uh, they'd never want to drink tea. Oh, that's for you. Yeah. They'd never want to drink tea with me, just like my life now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try to get like they try to get my dad to drink tea, like that's never gonna happen. That's always when they're roommates. But even though they're Taiwanese, like they get it. Like they'd sit down, drink a cup of tea. And if you never had tea with me guys, anyone listening, it, it's a long process. Like the tea isn't like a one and done type of thing. It's like you sit down, you put it in the pot, and you pour it out, and you drink it about like ten times usually, you know, because the tea it's um, it evolves throughout the process. Anyway, it's a hard thing to explain. But my point is, they sit down, drink one cup, go upstairs, smoke a cigarette, come down, and just fuck up the whole process. Like, I don't know if you've been around someone where there's just like one, it gets a whole clean environment, it smells nice. There's tea, tea smells good. Yeah. And then someone smokes a cigarette. Like even if they're not in the room, but when they come back in. The whole room just smells like cigarette now. Yeah. Like if they touch those teacups, the next person drinks tea out of them. It's just going to taste cigarette. Like it's really strong. And so it just completely dismisses like the whole point of the tea ceremony about yeah. calming down and noticing these small things. Yeah. You know, it, so they, they'd always do that. We didn't really get along in that way. <laughs> and they'd always go to nightclubs and stuff. And I wasn't really. I, I went sometimes. Uh, Taiwan's the place I did the most amount of clubbing yeah. in my life. Like now I have no desire at all. <laughs> yeah. Like to go to an American club sounds like. I gotta have to be really into the music, yeah. but in Taiwan, it's just it just made more. Like, people were a lot nicer in the clubs there. Really? Like I was trying to say this joke on stage the other night, where it's like it, the first time that I said something to a girl in a club in Taiwan, she stopped walking and looked at me and smiled. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Because like that, you know, man, like that's so ridiculous. Like to go to a bar around here in Costa Mesa, California, yeah, and like or say something to a girl and she looks at you and smiles. Like no not gonna happen yeah, well, yeah i mean well yeah they'll look at you no i don't know they'll look at you and smile I don't know. well to me like, i'm, I'm exaggerating know. yeah I, I, that, and that's yeah. another thing man i haven't i don't have that much experience going out in california because before i went to taiwan man i had um a very loyal girlfriend that i was into for like two years like yeah. so from the time i was 20 to 22 so i never went to a bar to hit on a girl in america before i went to asia so it's very interesting i'd like learn these things when i was out there yeah like i'd never like, that's such a common, like, college experience. You're 20, 21, 22, you just go to a bar and meet. I'd never done that. Yeah. And then you go to Taiwan, it's just a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. I, it's like bar on easy mode. Yeah, luckily I was I was in between girlfriends when I turned 21, so I, yeah, that was kind of cool. But all my friends were interesting at that time, cross-country guys and stuff, so we didn't really go out and see girls all that much, but it was good. still a fun time. i say it's overrated. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're really good at it. I don't know. I shouldn't talk. That's it's, not the point. Of this it's podcast. fun. It's fun now. <laughs> it's fun now. Yeah. You're enjoying it. Yeah. Good. So, life in <laughs> Taiwan, Rex. What do I have to tell you to get you to move there? <laughs> it makes so much sense for someone like you, man. Like, you're an educated guy. You're a white guy. You're pretty self sufficient. You're outgoing, open to new things, you're hardworking, but don't want to do something like. like what, what was the job you hated the most? Like, working in a bank? That was probably like my, one of those. That's jobs. probably my least favorite. Yeah, yeah, so you're not you're not into that. <clears throat> but going on teaching English, it's just fun and easy. That's the thing. Yeah. It's really easy to get it to do everything because Taiwan is just so racist. Like you just yeah. got to be white and like yeah. <laughs> have a college degree. I honestly think just like maybe a couple months where I till I get to pay off some of my debt. Yeah. And then everyone has debt, Rex. Yeah, but like I will have like paid off all of it by like then. Yeah. Yeah. So like. I'll yeah, live a, a unique life. A man without debt. That'd be fun, yeah. I can't even imagine. <laughs> that sounds crazy, man. Yeah. But yeah, so that, that's what I was talking about earlier, though. Like, almost every day I come up with, like, a new life plan. Like, here's something I could do. Here's a job I could do. Here's something, mm-hmm. like... It, it's kind of just an exercise in, like, um, 
crafting the life that I desire is you just go through it. It's a mental exercise, like what would be the best case scenario. Right. And one thing I found is that in my plans, all my roads lead back to Taiwan. Really? Like I could do this and then make enough money to go back to Taiwan or like <laughs> at some point, which is the exact same thing that I was told when I was leaving Taiwan. Yeah. A, a year and a week ago when I was in Taipei, um, we had this like really cool ceremony for me because I was missing the belt promotion. If I had stayed, I would have gotten a blue belt with everybody. But because I was leaving yeah. on such a specific day, they had like a special ceremony just for me. And that's when I found out I was leaving and all that. Yeah. And they kept telling me like, all right, you'll be back in like a year probably. <laughs> really? We've seen this before. Like someone thinks they want to go back to America. We, we, we know, we know. Because <laughs> <laughs> like the guys who are there are just like, like I didn't really, I didn't really appreciate it the first time I was there because I'd never worked a job really in America outside of outside of college or anything. Yeah. And so I didn't realize like how crazy it is to be in Taiwan to have these jobs available and have these people being nice to you, have like yeah. extra money and time. Yeah. I guess kind of a thing in America right now. If you want to work hard, like you will have money, but you will not have time. Yeah. And if you don't want to work that hard, you will have time, but you're not gonna have any money. True. You can't really do both. Yeah. And like live on your own. Yeah. But like in Taiwan, you can. Like it's crazy. It's almost like there's more hours in the day. That's the way it feels. That's interesting. Yeah. It's just crazy, like, <laughs> and it, it's a quote that I got in the Ai Weiwei documentary last night. We were talking about Ai Weiwei earlier. Yeah. He's, like, the most famous artist in, in China, and the reason that he's getting away with so much, he's, like, provoking the government in such strange ways, and the reason that he's able to go through with this is because he spent 12 years living in New York, and he's speaking about that time, and he's like, once you experience freedom, no one can take that away. They can't tell you that you have to go back to a different way, because you just know, like, it's too late. Yeah. And that's the way I feel. Like, anytime I've gone to an... A, an, in, uh, an interview for a job in America I've heard this several times they say you have to work 40 hours a week but everybody does that yeah like little things like that that are just so common into the work structure around here that I just know aren't necessary yeah you don't have to work 40 hours a week that's not even maybe the best idea for the business to yeah. have that like structure is not there's not much logic in it there's no heart in it for sure mm -hmm. and to say that everyone does that like i know it's not true i was working 16 hours a week in taiwan like i know that's not a bad thing like if you say that around here like i only want to work 16 hours I'm like what the fuck is wrong right with you? be a goddamn man yeah work 40 hours a week <laughs> yeah <but> like, <laughs> keep your chin up yeah just keep going but it's too late for me right? like if you worked like 30 hours a week in Taiwan, you'd be rich, right? Uh-huh. You could travel in the summer. You could, like, that's when, like, you have a motorcycle. Like, guys who have families do that. Like, guys literally raise families on 35 hours a week of teaching. Wow. Yeah. And it's, like, doable. So I was out there by myself, so I was doing half that. Yeah. And, like, had, had drinking money, you know? Like, yeah. Which I think is a big measure. Like, around here, I, I don't have any drinking money. Right. Like, to go to a bar, like, it's so frightening around here. But in Taiwan, I had, like, that amount of money. And my gym fee was incredible. Like, I was doing these uh, essentially personalized kettlebell classes. It's a kind of, it's like small class kettlebells. It kind of works out in the same way we've always, always imagined a personal trainer. Yeah. I was doing that and jiu-jitsu, paying, like, $200 to the gym. Yeah. And still had money for rent and <coughs> clothes and craziness. Yeah. What's the night like, life like out in Taiwan? Um, it's a lot of clubs. It's a big clubbing city. Um, but there's a new, like, like expat. Expat meaning, like, just someone from a different country who leaves their country of origin, moves someplace else. So all the white people in, in Taiwan, essentially, I'm referring to, they have a new craft beer scene. Oh, really? Which is, like, brand new. Yeah, it's really cool. Like, it evolved while I was there. Like, a bunch of breweries started popping up, yeah. having all these events. So I'd do a lot of that. You know, I'd go to yeah. Jiu-Jitsu, then I'd go to the craft beer bar. Um if it had been a while since I met a girl, go to the club. Yeah. Um, but I, I, clubs aren't really like that. It, it, every three months or so, I had fun at a club. Did DJs go there? Like famous ones? Mm hmm. Yeah. Cascade played, um, Dash Berlin, all the big house guys. Yeah. Um, I saw Corella play there um, yeah. on Halloween. Yeah. They came out and they're like, <laughs> we don't speak any Chinese, but we just came from Korea. Anyang! <laughs> 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 That's they're funny. really funny. They put on a really good show. Yeah. Uh, Paul Van Dyke played that night. He was really cool. Yeah. Um. Once every like three or four weeks, they'd have drum and bass night. Which yeah. I always went to, but it was at this really small club, like in a, um, in like a convention center area. Like it's like a place where they have like a big town hall type place <clears throat> with like little shops and museums nearby, mm -hmm. and like a big park and a club. 
Mm -hmm. So everything shut down except for this really small club, like the size of this backyard. Maybe if it's like 40 people, it'd be like pretty crowded. Right. And it's usually a gay club. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. It's That's like funny. <laughs> most nights it's a gay club. Uh -huh. But on drum and bass night, the gay crowd doesn't turn out. Like, you've yeah. been to a lot of drum and bass shows. It's really heavy music. Yeah. I'm not saying there's no gay guys into it, but I've been there on drum and bass night, and one time I went on house night not knowing. Yeah. And it was distinctly more gay yeah. on house night. Like, That's funny. Like, measurably. Yeah. As soon as you walk in, like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it's just funny, like, trying to get people to go, like, to someone who hasn't heard of drum and bass music, like, it's a hard sell, mm -hmm. normally. Right. And then to be like, yeah, it's at Triangle, like, at the gay place? No, man, what are you doing? What are you talking about? So that was always fun. Yeah. But what? then, you know, I was doing comedy shows out there and stuff, too, so... Yeah. So anytime there's a comedy show, I would, like, go to that. Which is kind of a thing, like... So Taiwan is known as one of the best hiking destinations in the world. It's like 80% national parks. There's hiking everywhere. Like where I was living in the city, it's a five minute walk to a couple hour hike up a mountain. Wow. That's crazy. Like you just walk there from the city. I can take the subway to a hike. Yeah. And, um, but every single weekend when I was like, this weekend I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna go hiking, I'm gonna go around the island. It's a really small island, you can get yeah. around really easily. I never went because Taipei, there's always something fun to do, always. Yeah. Really? Yeah, there's always a comedy show or a drum bass night. Or um, in the summer, every Saturday is a pool party. Yeah. They have a, <laughs> they have a water park. It's got one water s or two water slides and like a pool. That's that, crazy. That's a water park. Yeah, yeah. And they have these huge parties there <laughs> really? during the day every Saturday. But there's like kids there too. But there's all these adults just like getting hammered. That's crazy. The craft beer like station set up. People smoking joints. Like the first time I went there, I smoked a joint on the hour every hour without bringing any. You know wow. what I mean? Like it's just around and people are friendly and like in Taipei. Kind of get away with it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Which is crazy, man. Like because we we live right now in California. Like weed's so easy to get. We got all the weed from the store. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just very open. It's just don't do it in public type of thing. But in Taiwan, it's so illegal. But like at the same time, when it is around, it was more open. Like, I smoked a joint with a guy, like, crossing a street. Really? You know what I mean? Like, in the city, just uh -huh. in the crosswalk. Wow. Just walking, passing. You smoke at the water park, or just, like, not in the, on the dance floor. <laughs> really? Wow. But, yeah. But the penalties are a lot stronger. Like, my buddy, he, he's the first Taiwanese guy to be in the UFC. He did, I forget the details, I want to say two months in jail for having some weed in his pocket while he's sleeping in his car. Really? Wow. Yeah, the cop came up, knocked on his window, what are you doing? We check your pockets. Boom, gone. Wow. Maybe I'm missing a step in the story, but something like that. Like, yeah. uh, it's, he did time for it. I think two months. Wow. Yeah. And so that was a cool thing. Like, when I was out there, I didn't smoke that much. Because when I'm in California, man, I smoke every day. Like, it's so easy. Yeah. You know, like, when I was in college, my final two years of college, I didn't buy weed once, but I smoked every day. Yeah. Just around. Exactly. You know? But in Taiwan, I didn't. So What's the driving cool. situation like in Taiwan? Driving? Yeah. Com like, travel. Like, transportation to get to work to get to anywhere uh yeah. lost subway lost subway very good public transportation okay yeah well like biking and stuff is that big oh yeah oh so the my, one of my favorite things they had man is like public bikes uh -huh. which i think they have in a lot of cities in california but i've never seen a good system mm -hmm. like in san diego it's like five bucks and the places are very inconvenient to park yeah like you have to park and then walk to where you want to go like 30 minutes yeah or as opposed to in taiwan they're at like every subway station and very conveniently located at places you'd want to bike. Yeah. And it's like 50 cents. Oh, wow. So for 50 cents, you ride a bike across the city. Like, my favorite was I'd ride along this river and then cross it and on my way to jiu-jitsu, and you pass all these temples and all these markets. Yeah. Like, Taiwan's just full of markets and temples. What's the food like in Taiwan? A lot of street food. Really? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of like, anywhere, anywhere you're going, you can just pick up fruit on the way. What's That's the, my favorite part. What's, is there good sushi in Taiwan? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because uh, the Japanese had a lot of influence in Taiwan. They um, owned it for a brief period. Okay. And so they set up a lot of the infrastructure, and their culture is very um, influential. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of good Japanese food, a lot of good Chinese food. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fuck. Some good burgers. You yeah. found some good burgers. Really? It's a new thing. Steaks. Um... Sure, if you want it, you can find <laughs> yeah. it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's like a really funny chain of steak restaurants. I think it's called like King Cow or something. It's like the image is a cow with a crown on his head. Yeah. And I go there, and it's like, um, 
almost like a hometown buffet steak <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> okay, I get But you. like a good quality, but like really cheap, and yeah. like you can go there and get like uh, corn while you wait. You oh, get like wow. a salad bar. Yeah, okay. Like the Chinese version. So it's like American ish. Yeah. It's like in the vein of America, but. <laughs> your steak comes out covered in sauce you can't see it yeah <laughs> like you don't have much like you don't want to look at it but it's good yeah it doesn't look nice but <laughs> what are the people like in Taiwan so friendly man especially like um, when outside in any place the city center is gonna have the least friendly people mm -hmm. as you get out from there people get friendlier and Taiwan just went exponential like the my neighbors were these um, it was like this barber shop. Like, if I, if I exited my apartment to the right, it was a barber shop where these old people just sat there, not working very hard, chilling, chain smoking, playing. Um, it's essentially chess. They call it elephant chess. It's everyone's an animal instead of, like, ours are medieval stuff. It's uh -huh. animals. Yeah. Um, so they're just playing that and always just, like, they don't speak any English, but they're always, like, waving hello, offering me cigarettes, yeah. being friendly. And if I went out my apartment to the left was a, um, a car... Like, a, a mechanic. And the guy, the head guy there, his English was really good. And he'd always see me. I'd pass by there every day on my way to work. He'd always stop me and try to speak English. And he would invite me hunting, like, all the time. Really? Yeah. I'm kind of bummed that I never went. But like I said, there's always, like, something keeping me in Taipei. Something that, looking back, maybe wasn't so important, but felt important at the time. Yeah. I had a plan with somebody. I had a comedy show to do. Yeah. Something like that. So for those reasons, I never went with him. But he'd always, like, we hunt wild pig. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, like point to me on a map, like where he's going. Yeah. <laughs> like my son, very good English. You come, <laughs> and then, but I never did. But that guy, he ended up giving me a car for a couple of days. Oh, really? Yeah, because like Chinese New Year is during January, and it's like a week long thing where you just go pretty much like huddle up with your family for a week. <laughs> hey, mom. Hi, Judith. We're in the middle of a podcast. <laughs> 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 just telling stories. Just talking. <laughs> yeah. Just chit chat. Um, so, anyway, so during Chinese New Year, this guy came to me and he's like, uh, So, where are you going? Like, what do you do for Chinese New Year? Knowing that I don't have any work or anything. I was like, I don't know, man. I don't have a family. Like, I think I'll just stay around here. He's like, Stay here? Oh, man. You want a car? Take my car. Oh, wow. And so he gave me his car and, like, I got in it and I put in the ignition. He looked at me he's like, Can you drive? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> after the whole thing was done, I was like, Yeah, yeah, yeah I can drive. I'm good good driving yeah. but I don't know the rules in Taiwan like I'm sure there's different rules yeah. around here do they drive on the s same side of the road they I think so pretty sure yeah no the right side what do you drive on here the left side right side you drive on the right side <laughs> you drive on the right side I think it was the same but I drove a motorcycle in Indonesia where it's the opposite mm -hmm. and it was very hard because every time I came up like instincts take in you know a lot yeah. of driving is instinctual yeah and so you kind of have to look around and like just match what other people are doing. Yeah. So that's almost why I can't remember in Taiwan because that was the only time I did it. All I was doing was looking around, seeing what the, the other people were doing, and like following like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it was just chaos. Like no one's driving straight. It's all swerving. Yeah. I didn't really know where I was going. The streets yeah. are like not built for cars. Like America's or California at least is built for cars. Like yeah. everything's exactly that wide. Yeah. To get at least like to get safely, you never have to consider like. Fuck, am I going to hit this building? Yeah. Like when driving around here. Yeah. But in Taiwan, it wasn't built like that. It was built more like motorcycle size. Yeah. That's why scooters are more prominent there. Oh, really? And so I'd be going down these streets, and like if there's another car coming, like we can't both go. But I don't know protocol for that. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of like stop, and like I get yelled at a lot in Chinese. Yeah. Because obviously I look dumb. I'm just a white guy behind a car. <laughs> yeah. Like, just fucking up. Try, trying to drive. Trying my best, yeah. you know? <laughs> exactly. But I ended up, I went up to these mountains right behind my house that I always looked at, but I'd never been to. And just drove around, like, had the idea that I'd get out and hike, but I didn't know where to leave it. It's hard like, to leave a car that's not my own. Yeah, exactly. So I just kind of stuck with it, and, like, I brought some tea and would get out and sit on benches. It is awesome, man. Like, all these weird things are, like... See some good fireworks? So lots of good fireworks. Yeah, for New Year's, the Taipei 101, for one point in time, was the biggest building in the world. And it all lights up and shoots off these fireworks like it's exploding. Wow, that's insane. Yeah. What are the girls like in Taiwan? Uh, beautiful, Chinese, and nice. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. At least, like, the ones that I talked to. It can't be all of them, but it's kind of like a... There's a sense of, like, pre-selection in Taiwan. Where if you talk to a girl on here, you don't really know, like, what kind of guy she's looking for. Because, like, just kind of all around. There's, there's too many types going on. 
But in Taiwan, it's like most girls are into Taiwanese guys or white guys, and the ga- girls are just into Taiwanese guys. I didn't come across them. They're not hanging out at the American bars. They're not approachable at clubs. You know what I mean? There's like yeah. a self-selection. So the only girls that like really are talking that make themselves available for me to talk to that are coming out to the same place as I am. Yeah, because they like white guys. Yeah. Yeah. And they, I kind of have like the look. I, I'm tall enough. I'm white enough. Mm-hmm. And they have a good California accent. <laughs> yeah. And all these little things. Like not necessary. You know, like British guys do well, obviously, and stuff. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of other good options. But this is just one of them. It fits a very, it fits a stereotype for them, mm-hmm. which is really cool. Worked to my advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was nice. Because like, when I was traveling, man, I, was, I was, like, wasn't doing well with girls at all. Because like I said, I broke up with that girlfriend right before I left. And that was heavy. I'd like, I was like the best, to this day, the best girl I've ever known was her. Yeah. And we just broke up and it was like hard. Yeah. Um, and so, I was many months of like not getting with any girls. Even like, I got a hooker in Thailand and like didn't even finish. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> didn't want to fuck her. Yeah. Um, which is a story that I've written. I've been telling it on stage a couple times. Um, if anyone's interested in that story of me getting a hooker and not finishing, I have it all written up. Uh, <laughs> send me a message, I'll send it to you. Yeah. I think I, I, I think I should like post. I, I think I should post it on the internet, but um, I just haven't. It's, yeah. Yeah. That is one of the things I've been doing since I got back. I wrote out so many travel stories, and they're just like sitting on the computer, like just unedited. Yeah. You know what I mean? I did like a lot of first drafts. Yeah. Um. So I think at some point something will be done with them, but at this point they're just sitting there collecting yeah. cobwebs. Yeah. So how, how's your image of Taiwan these days? Well, what, what, it just what, got a lot. Making? It's made it a lot better. Yeah. This conversation. And so here's what I'm thinking, man. So Taipei in Chinese means northest. It's the northest part of the island. The next time I go to Taiwan, I want to hang out in the south. Yeah. Where it's tropical. It's hot all year. Because Taipei has, has seasons. It's got rainy seasons. It's really hot in the summer. It's really cold in the winter. And the rooms don't, or they aren't very well insulated, so it's pretty close to the temperature. Excuse me. The temperature outside is pretty close to the temperature inside. When it's cold outside, you're gonna be cold in your room. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a really cool jiu-jitsu gym in the south. That I really want to be a part of. It's much more forward-thinking. Yeah. And very similar to the gym I'm at now at Tenth Planet. Yeah, it's very similar in Kaohsiung what they're doing. Yeah. So that's my next destination. Uh, when you decide to move to Taiwan with me, I think that's where it will be. <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> it's, it's coastal. It's more beachy. Yeah. Um, Taipei, like, the beach isn't far, but it was, it was never that dope. Like, I, I went surfing out there a couple times and, like, never had that good of a session. Yeah. You know? But it was cool. It was more of, like, a novelty thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions, Rex? How long have we been talking? 30 yeah. minutes? Yeah, I think I'm... No, I don't have any more t- questions at all, actually. No more questions? No. You know something we haven't talked about on the podcast, Rex? Hmm. The fact that you live at my house now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is such like, a funny situation. Like, I've never heard of this situation in my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm 25, you're 26, and we live with my parents. Yeah. You just moved into my brother's room. <laughs> yeah. A room he hasn't occupied in 10 years or so. Like, he, he's been out of the house this whole time. Maybe a little more longer than that. <laughs> yeah, 10, 12 years, probably. Something like that. It's just really funny. Like, I'm surprised my parents went for it. Yeah. Like, yeah, I actually live here. Yeah. Okay. Because for, like, six years, they were living here by themselves. Yeah. I didn't live here for seven years. I don't know the last time Corey was here. Longer than that. Longer than that. So, yeah, for seven years, my parents lived by themselves. Yeah. And now there's two of us in the house. Yeah. Just sit in the backyard, smoking weed all day. It's, like, prob- it's probably just really chill for them, interesting for them to watch us do stuff as well. I think they like it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's not wasn't much a uh, uh, disruption of their routine previously. Whereas I, last night, last night was my mom's birthday, uh-huh. and me and you we, we smoked a lot of weed and went to dinner with them, <laughs> which I thought was great. At like, the country club, at the <laughs> <laughs> like the fanciest place that I've been to. Yeah, is this place I've been to regularly, the Mesa Verde Country Club, place my dad's been a member of for like my whole life. <laughs> and then, <laughs> how, how was your experience in that place? How many times have you been there? Like three or three times, three or four times, I think. And so we're there just stoned in these like big rain spooner shirts. <laughs> yeah. Like Rex looks so funny, like in this huge like these shirts are like oversized. Like we were wearing like sailors outfit. Or, like, Hawaiian like, shirts kinda. They're like, yeah, like, like they're really like <laughs> thick kind of cotton quality. If there's a big wind we could take flight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
the crisp. <laughs> that definitely. <laughs> and then so we went to that dinner last night, and it was just so funny. I kept laughing. I was like, "How did this happen?" Man? I just I ate like way. I had that last plate of food I shouldn't have eaten. That was a little too much. So we all felt Rex. Yeah. And then last night I, we went back to the house and we're sitting back here and smoke a weed and we smoked a lot because my cousin just dropped us all this weed at our house. Yeah, like and then t- like ten grams. And then at ten thirty, man, at ten thirty, I ran into that room and started talking to my mom about how we need to watch the movie Samsara. Like, mom, it's your birthday. This is important. What's Samsara? <laughs> it's like <laughs> the hardest movie to explain in the world. Really? Netflix calls it a contemplative documentary. <laughs> this dude just travels around and shows images of dope things. He goes to Tibet and just shows the monks walking around. I don't know. It's like hard. To, he goes to the mosque or the 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 um, yeah. He goes to a bunch of different mosques. What's the the thing? Mecca. He goes to Mecca. Yeah. Has like, all of them walking Medin. around. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just shows all these dope things like with no real like message uh-huh. or anything. It just kind of goes all Anyway, I ran to my mom and tried to explain it to her last night. And I was like, Mom, this has to happen. It's going to help our relationship. She's like, you're high. <laughs> like, true, but we need to. <laughs> and to her credit, she put it on. We watched Samsara last night. She A movie it. I recommend to everybody. Did she like it? Oh, of course. It's so cool, man. Like, it just shows the desert for, like, a couple minutes. Here's the desert. But there's no... um like narrator in the movie there's no characters it's yeah. literally he just shows things no one talks like have, have you ever seen clips of the prison in the philippines where the inmates dance no they, they have a bunch of viral videos of them like dancing the thriller really where it's, like, it's it's really impressive it's like i don't know how many guys but like too many to count we couldn't count them on the screen right a couple hundred maybe a thousand i don't know and they're all dancing in unison oh in wow this huge prison lot so that's the scene in the movie <laughs> It's a really cool stuff like that. But yeah, know. it was a great day yesterday. <laughs> it was a long day too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm running out of steam, Rex. Glad we did this though. Talked about Taiwan. Something I want to talk about for a while, but it's one of the many things in my life that is so strange and unique that it no one's gonna relate to it unless they've been. Right. And I don't know anyone around here's been. <laughs> How did you keep in touch with your parents? Um, for Skype? No. <laughs> they I had to wait until I got a phone. Like, because, n- yeah, they don't know how to use Skype. They didn't know how to use, like, any of these things. We don't have, if we had iPhones, we could FaceTime, but we don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I don't I just didn't try very hard on it. And then in Taiwan, I got a phone. And I didn't realize until I got out there, man, like, phones in America are such a ripoff, and they're not in other places. Really? Like, to sign up for a phone number here, it's, like, a two-year plan, hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And it's just, like, you're locked in. Like, in Taiwan, it was $6, and it came with a month a month of service. Wow. And then for 10 extra dollars, I could call America for, I think, like, an hour. Wow. Something like that. So you just call your, you could call your parents kind of at whim almost? Mm-hmm. And so I did. I, I called them. Like, the first time I called them, they went, <gasps> Because it had been months, like, the whole time that I was, like, outside of Taiwan, in Indonesia, and Thailand. Like, I didn't, like, I was, I was pretty rude about it. Like, I didn't yeah. realize. But um, and I never thought this until I read it in Steve Martin's book. He had a very similar experience when he left town. Yeah. And he has, like, this grand conclusion where he's, like, looking back, I wasn't even mad at my parents or anything. It wasn't, like, an outright. I didn't contact them because I didn't, because no one told me to. Yeah, and like when I read that in his book, I was like, okay, that's like what I was doing too. Like I just didn't know. Yeah, I didn't think even now. Like, I don't if I don't see someone, I don't think too often. Like, you know, it's hard to think about people who aren't around. It's an unfortunate part of like being other places. Right. And yeah, my parents we never like talk too much either. Even when we're around each other, we're not very communicative. Yeah. Yeah, it's the way it was. Yeah, well, I think that was a pretty good podcast. Think so, man? Yeah. I think people are listening. I think that's quality. I think this is the one that uh, gets us mainstream. I think this is, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think our next guest will be Dan Carlin. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. You're going to shoot up the ranks? Yeah, I know. Dude, the next guest is actually is supposed to be really big. I c- shouldn't say next, but I've been talking to Dirty Ron Turner, two-time black belt. Really? He's a black belt in the gi and 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. He's the coach at 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu Costa Mesa. Wow. One of my favorite people in the world. We're in talks to get him on this podcast. That's going to be a good one. That should be a quality one. That should be a great one. Yep. Yeah, he's like the funniest dude in the world. 
He's the one that I invited my buddies Sonny and Joey, who both been on this podcast. They came to a practice mm-hmm. for over, over Ron's. He was running it. And afterwards, we're all smoking weed in the parking lot. And Ron's like, guys, I forgot to tell you the first rule of jiu-jitsu. Don't marry strippers. No matter what they say, they're not going to change. <laughs> 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 and Ron, he just led this, like, crazy life that's so different than mine. Yeah. yeah. Mine was, like, private schools and, like, all these really safe things. And he was, like, bouncing and working strip clubs for, like, 20 years. Wow. Like, he has so many stories. Like, you've been out in Newport more than I have, so you know the locations he's talking about. But he's bounced in, like... Every place that I, that sounds like every place in Newport. Yeah. He's gotten in so many fights, so really? many street fights. <laughs> oh, my god. He's talking about how, like, before before the UFC was keeping, became popular, fights were way easier. Because, like, no one knew how to hold their hands or anything. They're just going off, like, kung fu movies. Yeah. And so he said, like, yeah, fighting used to be really easy because I knew, like, kickboxing and jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. But now it's like everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for real. Yeah, it's just like a funny perspective that like I'll never have. I've never been in a street fight. Exactly. Have you ever been in a street fight, Rex? No. Yeah, and so like, but most people in jiu-jitsu have. That's the way that most people come into it. Like I'm, uh, I when anytime it comes up in the gym that I've never been in a fight, people go, "What? What? Do you mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. a unique thing." Yeah. So hopefully that's on the next podcast. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, what are we doing? Where's rambling? Yeah. Oh well. All right. All right. Well, it was fun. Anybody listening, send me a message. I'll send you a story about me getting a hooker, if you want it. See ya. So long.